Hello, everybody! If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining me, as always, is the new convert to the power of Lumineth Realm Lords. It's Tom. What's up, buddy? Hello, friends. He has his own strange creature from another realm there. <laughs> yeah, he's not small anymore. <laughs> he's clearly very excited to be in your lap right now. Yes. Uh, also joining us, good painter Elfman now. He, that's right, uh, one of the great proponents of the Lumineth for the longest time, uh, Mr. Martin Orlando. Good to have you back on the show, buddy. How are you doing tonight? It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, those who had seven minutes, uh, you win. That is, in fact, how late Tom was today. So congratulations to the seven-minute pool. Uh, you win. Congrats. Wait, well done. Well done. Uh, it was, it was, we got double whammy by Tom tonight, uh, who, who had both, uh, stuff he was waiting on his wife and then had technical issues. So it was a real, real good time. But anyway, just, it just piled right up. Yes. Indeed. That's, that's, that's the quality that we promise you. If you tune in every week, every week, this is the kind of quality we'll deliver. We're going to be talking about Lumineth Realm Wars tonight. Oh my goodness, do we have a show for you tonight. I am excited. Don't forget if you're watching at any point and you like this, like maybe you like Tom's dog. It's cute. Hit the like button. It's great. It helps people find the show. So, but first off, let's of course start with the news. Tom. Uh, so how about that, uh, that candles? Yeah, it's a, it's a, this is, now we're back to a death thing. This is going to be a vampire mm -hmm. thing. Uh, probably maybe like a new centerpiece thing. Well, you know, like maybe this is a piece of their centerpiece. Does that make sense? What What do you think, Martin? Um. So hold. On. I was. Just, I'm pulling it up on. Um. So I can see the chat and everything. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. So I said. So I said. It's. It's. It, there's. There's like a checklist. Like um. On what we do in the shadows. There's a ghost checklist. Um. So you got your candles. Yes. You got your your yep. your uh, smoke slash ectoplasm trail sculpted in hard plastic. Of course. And you got and you got your your angular uh, possibly ancient candelabra. Yes. Um, you got ghosts. I agree. This is definitely a death thing. Uh, we are back to AOS here. Uh, unusual that, that you have uh, all the flames and the candles being that melty. They did. They're doing a nice job. They're really upping their candle sculpting. Mm -hmm candelabra flame game totally agree and this is night haunt i don't know how you see anything else but night haunt here we know that a night haunt hero is coming yeah true um this is night haunt okay all right i could be completely wrong and i would accept that as well sure but i'm pretty sure this is night haunt yeah i love we got all these it's going to go to the next news item too we've got all these like single figures coming that i want to know when we're getting them like gardas <laughs> And the new Night Haunt guy, and what we're about to talk about, which is the next news item. Oh man, let's talk about them witch hunters. Boom! Oh. Let's talk about those witch hunters. So we're actually going to start on him because he was the first one spoiled. But it's a father daughter team. Uh, Tom, tell us about why you're excited about the witch hunter squad. Uh, it's because in the article they're like from the Order of Azir, and I was like, that's what I want to hear. Sure. Um, that's the army that I want. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I've longed for the Order of Azir, Witch Hunter, Warrior Priest, ex Extremist Army. Um, that's why I'm excited. But they're amazing looking. Like this father-daughter mix. I, I just... Oh. Yeah, so they, obviously they, this is the, they the look, dad. And then they we've got literally the daughter. Look like they've walked in off the streets of Mordheim. Uh, they're great. Uh, no doubt. Uh, I continue to be not sure about the team's ability to paint female faces. Uh, <laughs> I've said before that I feel like the team should watch some makeup contouring videos, and I stand behind that opinion. Um, yeah. They, like, I don't think she actually has a weird face. I think that the paint is accentuating it in a weird way. But anyways, Martin, what do you think of these two? Yeah, just to touch on that last point. I think she's supposed to be much like much younger, like maybe, like late to, uh, late teens. And I think the sculptors tried to go for a look that maybe the painters couldn't quite. Um, like the heavy metal style leads to a very particular way yeah. of how the faces the the faces are painted. It's almost like um, 
not quite cell shading, like where you, where you get sort of like that newer anime style, like um, you have two tones of color and then you have the hard outline where shadows might otherwise be, which I think tends to lead to the, um, like the, just the disconnect that we might have. We're reading faces. Yeah, she um, just doesn't have enough yeah. softness under her eyes, color over her eyes to separate it. Yeah. Like the this um, this paint line on her cheek is over accentuated. This like mm -hmm. these these have a name, but like whatever this is, is like mm -hmm. way too dark. I mean it's like if I pull it down my face down like that, it's like that's yeah. the level of shadow she's got. Uh, too much. But but otherwise, like I don't know how we're getting out of well, I mean shipping schedules and, and, and everything, like notwithstanding. I don't know how we get out of the next 12 months, I'll say it that way, without an order of Azir army. Um, I hope they are the sort of spiritual successor to Bretonia that uh, OBR is to Tomb Kings after a fact. That's just going to be the new Stormcast. Yeah. I'm betting on those Bretonian Stormcasts. Yeah. That's too uh, much of a slam dunk. And it would yeah. look like the original art that was commissioned for what Stormcast yeah. was. Yeah, I mean, but what you could actually have is you could have a mixed human Stormcast army with the Stormcast being the more knightly, right? Yeah, and then called... the humans being uh, like Order of Azir. Correct. We don't like, need an Order of Azir army. Like, I, I do not think we're going to get a new book. You never, I don't, I, money on the table. You're not going to sure. see Battle Tome Order of Azir. Sorry. Sure. Uh, yeah. It, it'll get added okay. to, it'll probably get added to the cities. Yes. It'll be a sub faction in I... cities like, uh like the darkling coven's keyword or what I, I had like, i had this whole i had this whole thing planned out actually like there's like so, so much for that then um i was like well what if you add what if you added like camelot style pageantry to sub factions mm -hmm. that have like so you, so you mix sort of that 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 merlin knights of the round table vibe with van helsing so instead of having your your rather um heaven and hell sort of palette you you add back in that um that that nightly regalia into sure. into your 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 which because uh, everything in warhammer is ultimately intended to have that color-coded pageantry because mm -hmm. it's the agency of the of the hobbyists to paint however they want sure so you want to create your factions with this ability to be as colorful as possible mm -hmm. um if if all of the kits that are part of the order of azir end up not really deviating too much from this uh, 40k Inquisition or, or a Mordheim Witch Hunter vibe, which kind of has a limited color palette, then yeah, it's not getting its own book. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The, the way to do this is real simple, okay? It's right. a new city. It's called the Order of Azir is the city, and they're from Azir, okay? And, like, that's where they're from. They're the representative of that. And, of course, they can have one in four Stormcast like normal. In fact, maybe they can go farther. Like, it could, you could even see it where they're, like, two and four or something like that can be Stormcast, right? Half your army, yeah. by count, could be Stormcast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, it, it'd be that easy to, to do this kind of thing. And would they roll out new models? Sure, you could see some new models for it. It'd be easy. There's lots of, there's lots of stuff like this you can do. You can have some relaunched warrior priests. You can have some relaunched, uh, uh, you know, additional, you, well, you got these new witch hunters. You could have a flagellant type. You could have other types of, you know, pseudo-religious figures. Yeah. Easy. Right. Yeah, like the altars and the warrior priests and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. We've lost all that. And so all that kind of gets rolled into its own faction. And, man, that'll sell. Like, and you could have a Sisters of Sigmar style mm -hmm. aspect to it, and it'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Like, a, Exactly. Simple. And it doesn't need to yep. be like the Inquisition, where it's... I mean, it would have the same generic vibe. That is to say, sure. like, they're there to hunt down enemies. But, like, part of the thing of the Inquisition is they're, they're not a very... They're not a very heroic group of people. Like, mm -hmm. I know everybody loves Eisenhorn and stuff, right? But they're all pretty terrible people. Okay. I mean, they get the job done, let's be honest. Whereas this, well, I'm saying in 40k... Whereas in oh, this, you right. could actually have them be heroes, right? Like, one yeah. of the great things about Age of Sigmar is that we actually can have heroes. That doesn't right. mean they need to be perfect. They can still have right. flaws. Flawed heroes are still heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they would be the perfect mantle for that. Like, humanity's best against monsters, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, fighting with yeah. these, like, super soldiers on their side. Uh, like, look, when you've got your Avengers, 
you've got Thor, but you also have Black Widow and Hawkeye, and that's fine. You need the whole team. What is it, like the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. They are Azir's agents of Azir. Yeah. This is this is, this is is a slam dunk, yeah. folks. Slam dunk. Yeah, I love both of these. Very excited to get both of these. That is a heck of a crossbow. Uh, they're cool. I'm sure their rules in AOS will be terrible. Okay. Hey, hey, you shut your mouth. I have hope because they're in Broken Realms, that they're going to be good. Well, based on the Witch Hunter we're about to talk about in their AOS rules, I am not sure that that's an, uh, that hope is founded on anything. Uh, I mean, it's it's specialist games, though, right? It's a different division. It's like Forge World getting War Scrolls. Like, they're War Scrolls, but... Are they? Um, continue. Your next news item, Tom. Hit me. What do we got? Uh, well... It's the Vampire Warband pre-orders this week. That's the next one, but that's not what you wanted to do. Uh, let's do scrolls and points for units in Purse City. Yeah, they're all bad. Which is... Some of them don't even have a book keyword. They're just death war scrolls. Like, so they're but, clearly like waiting for something else to happen. Yeah, let's break this into two categories broadly. Like this show isn't about discussing the Curse City War Scrolls, but let's just break this broadly into two categories, okay? Let's talk the good guys and the bad guys. Simple enough framing? Okay. Sure. The good guys. All about 100 or 110 points. I shouldn't have said they're all bad. That was hyperbole. The KO dude is actually interesting because he's both a Skyfarer and a Marine and has actually a pretty cool, unique ability to, like, shoot a monster and then it can't go away from him. So the KO guy, I think, is actually pretty cool. Uh, Because he does slot right in. He's Barak Mornar, I think, right? Yeah, I'm going to stick him in a... uh, A... We're all waiting. I'm a, a gun hauler. Okay, there you I'm go. I'm gun hauler with the collapsible thing. Yeah, the compartment, I'm going to yeah. teleport it, and I'm going to be like, pow! You ain't going to your Archeon. You have to kill me first, and yeah. guard Archeon, I'll do that. He'll do that. That's fine. But that'll hold him for a turn. Absolutely. Just keeping Archeon <laughs> out of the game. Like, you joke, but keeping Archeon out of the game in some of these armies for even one turn would basically mean those lists lose the game. Like, yeah. if he's not on he an objective clear clearing objective. something, yeah. Yep. then then yep. they lose because oftentimes those like archeon lists tend to be so centered on him just yep. kicking teeth every single round that they often yep. don't score what they need to win until like round four or five so if you just literally stop him from going somewhere for a turn it can be the game uh yep. so no the ko dude is good this ends the list everybody else is like whatever who cares. so let's not uh, yeah i mean i think that Saying it's bad, I don't think capture is actually the issue. You're right. And you you said it elsewhere. The issue is it's boring. Correct. Like the tech, and which is worse than being bad. Yes. Because it's just uninteresting. Yeah. And it could have just been Ipsum Lorem text right. on so many of the units. I think it's now. Now here's what could save them. Okay. Here's what could save all of them. If you gave me rules. For Olfenkarn, the city, and made it a city of Sigmar. Sure. Like, post-redemption, sure. like, if these heroes win at the end of Cursed City, and we get a city of Olfenkarn, but, like, death is still there, and maybe, like, somehow you can have one in four death units or something, or I don't know, whatever. Something interesting. Like, then you, you could have be like, my okay, attention. cool. Right, like, I could, I could see playing these. I like that. The problem is that most of the scrolls are just, like, not only are they not competitive, which is fine, like, whatever. That's, I, I admit I was being jokey, right? That was specifically yep. for Doug. I hope he watches this back. I'm talking to you, Doug. Um, since I know that'll drive him completely insane that I said it that way. Um, no, I agree with you. The, the issue is they're, there's nothing... They could have done interesting stuff. I'll give you a simple example, because we kind of talked about this a little bit when you and I were chatting, right? Mm-hmm. One of the leaders could have been like, uh, you know, gave a bonus to flagellants or something. Like, plus one to hit for flagellants sure. that, are, that are within sure. a radius around yep. them. Whatever. Okay. Right, they could have had that doesn't little... make that doesn't make flagellants good. No, but it creates a, a a design thread that will pull you that direction. Right, and makes me want to go. Yeah, I kind of want to run those. Cool, because if you already like flagellants, you're like neat. Now I want to use this guy. I've got a cool way to buff my flagellants. I make and like cities is really a power pair book, right? That's yeah. why I'm pushing that because when you look yeah. at the way cities is constructed, it's like, do you like elves? 
cool, take some elves and then take the guy on dragon who leads the elves. Those go together well. Do you like dwarves? Cool, take the take the dwarves you like and the rune lord that makes those dwarves better, right? Like, that's the nature of the city's book. It's just this power pair book. Yeah. If, if I may just add, and, and this is just a question, like, I, I don't know if anyone who can say has an answer. Like, I didn't really read any of the scrolls after I saw the pitch battle profile where you have to take the entire retinue of the bad guys that aren't bodies as one pitch battle profile. Now, at first I thought um, it's sometimes these pitch battle profiles are based on the sprues that you can buy, like the boxes. Sure. And I was looking inside the box, like from unboxing videos, I don't, I don't own the box. And it's like, well, that I guess that makes sense because all of the hero sprues are kind of on their own. Like Kurt, um, Silver Tower was like that. You had the, right. the individual ones, which is why they were able to be sold individually later. Um, and that was true, except for the fact that uh, Radicar is his own it. sprue. Yeah. And I'm like, so I no longer understand why this decision was made. And uh, I have a guess, but continue. Let finish. Yeah, your, yeah, your yeah. I'm, I'm almost done. And the other thing was, is like I looked at the keywords. So it's like, okay, the zombies and the skeletons don't have updates in them. Updates are probably coming in the Soul Blight battle tome. That's fine. Um, but the other ones, they just have the GA death keyword. They don't have a Soul Blight, uh, or, or specifically, like they don't have the legions they don't have of soul the Gash. Grave Lords as the keyword. A, a book or keyword is what I'm looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like I, I don't understand the purpose of them having these rules. Um, mm -hmm. Now, War Cry is another another thing. Like, um, and I'm sure that they will not like. You can't take them all as one set in War Cry, so that might be where you get more longevity out of these models anyway. But I, I really would have preferred if you could have taken some of the stuff piecemeal because that's what most people are going to do anyway. Sure. So let's let me touch on the death side now. So yeah. like I said with the order side, I feel that the missed opportunity wasn't to make them competitive. I honestly don't want them to be so because I wouldn't want to see all these weird heroes locked away in a very expensive box suddenly be like the hottest new thing you have to find. That's not going to help the secondary market. Any No issues there. I would have liked to see them try to make other older, less used units interesting through fun synergies and stuff like that for one hero, like have them all do different things or interact with troops in just kind of an interesting way because then people who do like that again there's no competitive breaking to that it's not driving the market crazy no one's out all we we all got to get uh you know jelson derrick or whatever you know like that's not what it's what's happening um but it it allows for people who really want to have a cool force to have a cool force so that's order the death side i think the answer is much simpler they wrote this stuff before the soul Blight grave lords book was finished because originally these were supposed to come out way the, not so close mm -hmm. to each other like this yeah. this box was supposed to re re release in like October of last year or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's way off schedule. And clearly there was meant to be more distance in between this and Soul Blight Gravelords. So they just used the old scrolls. It's the old existing scrolls. And they were like, well, rather than worry about trying to figure out how these things should be pointed or will fit in their current form or whatever into the book where they're going to basically fit into legions right now, that's where you would use them. They're just like, we'll just put one big price on them. That'll dissuade their sort of use right now in a book we're all about, in a book we're literally about to throw in the trash anyways. Right? Keep it to, yeah. keep it to, to a curse city. And then we'll, I mean, get new, we'll get new points and new new scrolls in a month. The, so the two things I would add is this. Uh, the first is that I think that they are... Um, I disagree with you about the heroes because they're on their own sprues they could have been released separately like the other silver tower heroes were sure like so if they were written with like rules that people wanted they have the freedom to actually release them in their own clan packs yeah, yeah well so the, I, for a curse study they're actually not they're a different color plastic but they're on two sprues oh so are they yes. yeah so only it's the ally is on, on yeah. his own yeah, yeah. Only now, oh, on that own. doesn't weird. mean no interesting okay. that doesn't mean they couldn't put out a box of all the heroes mm -hmm. heroes right? of wolf and Karn. yeah the heroes of wolf and Karn box could come out it'd be a single sprue box like it could be done okay yeah. so yes of course they could release them of yeah. course they could um, i'm just saying they're not going to release them individually right after the box and if these sure. rules made them real super sweet and suddenly hyper competitive, it just wouldn't have been a good situation, especially when right. the production isn't keeping up right now. I agree. And actually, I think that that's why we got the clustering of all the death units together. 
my theory is that they couldn't point, they couldn't effectively point two vampire spawn at four or three vampire spawn at 40 points or wherever they would need to be sure, sure. With, without breaking list building. You know, because suddenly like, the minimum cost for many armies was like in that like 80 to 100 point range. Sometimes they go as low as 60, but very rarely. You know, they couldn't point those things at 80 points because they're really not worth that. And so if they did them at 40 points, suddenly like they're now competing with the spare command point or endless spells. And they could really find themselves in a position where they're essential to a lot of death lists because they're just the that extra 40 points that you can throw in there and the reality is is that they don't want to force that and i think that that's a wise decision and so the way you dissuade that is you just lump them in with other stuff as one big take yeah i mean yeah. all in all like this isn't the point of the show so i don't want to go down this rabbit hole too sure. far but but here's sure. what I'll, I'll i'll close with my my answer would be i agree with everything you said tom but we know or like by all accounts let me say it this way we're getting a new zombie scroll in Soulblight Gravelords. We're getting a new skeleton scroll in Soulblight Gravelords. Many of these leaders and stuff and units will show up in Soulblight Gravelords. And so we'll probably have a new scroll. And in that, we'll probably have their own individual... Like, their own individual prices to be taken alone, right? Um, I doubt they'll keep them all grouped as one massive 680-point group in there. Plus... Then we'll be months on from Curse City, and at some point they probably will do like the heroes of Open Karn Box or the villains of Open Karn Box, especially if we eventually get a City of Open Karn release somehow. Right? right. If that shows right. up in a later Broken Realms book, then of course the box they would release with that, like if Broken Realms 4 has Open Karn <laughs> redeemed or something or whatever, right? Then all of a sudden you're going to get. The, the the box release that comes with that is going to be like the heroes of open can right. can we just pause for a moment and reflect on the reality that a year and a half ago a year ago we were pontificating about the desire that man they should just release cities for every realm sure and now we're getting them yeah it's great and like we're getting that folks like let's celebrate that we have a death city now open Karn. we have a high city from broken realms like it's gold, man. Like I, yeah, sure. I couldn't have asked for something more amazing. Yeah, we have a, an, another a, a new Oxy City and a new uh, and a yep. Shaiish or not Shaiish, I'm sorry, and a um, uh, Realm of Shadow City. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, right on. It, it just win all the way down. And I say keep the train rolling. More cities. Keep it. Keep it going. Yep. It's an it, endless expansion. All right, what else? Uh, speaking of that, I'll just hit another news item real quick while we're on the the, sure. the, or the Curse City thing, as I know this is in there, is they also published free rules for uh, a Warcry uh, campaign uh, using the, the Curse City stuff, which was great. Just put out the PDF. Uh, they they said, here you go. You want to run a campaign with your, your Curse City stuff? Here's the rules for Warcry. Have a good time. I love when they do stuff like this. I love when they add other rules to allow us to use our toys in more ways. A plus work there. Thank you for putting that together. I don't, I don't, was that Sam who put that all together? I'm not sure. Um, but whomever it was, great stuff. Yes. Great, deeply great appreciate job, it. Sam. Yeah. Yep. If that was him. Whomever was so responsible, good. A plus work. Please keep doing that. Yep. Love it. All right. What um, else we got? Other news. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the Vampire Warband pre orders dropping this week, and that is exciting. Oh my god, those guys are beautiful, and I know they're like already. People are just like you know, that is, there is no speaking of things not having enough copies. There is no way they will have enough copies of that Vampire Underworld Warband. This will be like the big, the, like the best selling Underworld Warband of all time. You mean our not Vampire Warband? Yeah, that one. I mean, four Vampire Lords in a box Vampire Warband. Yeah. I'm turning that into two separate projects on its own. Yeah, like, of course you are. Yeah, that yeah. because that makes total sense. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, it is. It is. Yeah, it's a kit basher's dream. You you can get so much. So much mileage will be get out of that box. I will not be surprised if it shows up in like AOS twenty eight pages. Uh, oh, sure. The forty k equivalent yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's just everything you could want is in there. There is no way that any of Bat Hair Vampire Lady sells. Okay, 
like you know i'm talking about like the new vampire lord that's coming vampire bat hair lady okay i know all about vampire bat lady why in the universe of all that is warhammer would you be like well i could use vampire bat hair lady who's fine like she's fine okay she's fine yeah or i could use one of these four like ultra badasses right mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it is inconceivable to me that you would make that choice. I just, I I cannot get it. Uh, but I hey, can't, to each their I own can't wait for their Vampire Palooza War Scroll, where it's four vampire lords for 400 plus points. Sure. As one page battle profile. You'll be talking about that next week. There you go. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Goobs, yeah. who said uh, Bat Hair Lady needed to come out first. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. You don't, you don't, you don't, it's like, it's like an opening act versus the main band, right? Like, you don't, you don't have the Rolling Stones come on stage and open for, like, your, your local dad rock band. That's not how it works. It's got to be the other way around. Uh, what? Well, why do you got to hate on Bat Lady, Vince? I don't hate on her. As I said very clearly, she's fine. That was very but... clear. The Underworld Warbands are all just... The, those bottles are amazing. They are pure 11s. There is a difference yeah. between fine, a perfectly good sculpt, nothing wrong with it, and pure, unadulterated metal, right? Which yeah. is the difference we're talking about here. Okay? Like, I'm sorry. Some things are just incredible, and these are four truly amazing sculpts. That's the bottom line. That's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so we'll move on to our last news item. Uh, big shakeup dropped today. Uh, a number of positions got announced at GW, including a lead developer position. I, given that we've spent how many weeks on design and development shows in the last four weeks, three of the four weeks, um, that's the fastest job creation I've ever seen. <laughs> no, I mean, look. Yeah. Joking aside, we have been talking about the need for a formal developer role for two years. It's yep. le that is legitimately true. I went back and looked when we first started talking about it. Um, I, I, I am not sure that this role is actually doing exactly what I would construct it to be doing. I think yeah. it actually feels more like a product owner. Uh, role right. uh, than than how it's construed well, under development. That being said, ecos it seems like it's an ecosystem owner. Like it owns the entire of uh, that involves design and development. Yeah, I mean, my guess is it's a development lead. Uh, something yeah, but like don't that. they have that already, Tom? There are yes, there is that there is an overall ecosystem manager. Yes. Well, well, when I say ecosystem, I'm talking about the rules ecosystem. Pretty yeah, like yeah. they have a product manager. They have a you know like they have the other leads and so um but gw management is a spider web not a ladder it is it is well, a very strange indecipherable in, in, uh, sort of web way uh yeah. that being said i am beyond excited about this i love seeing this post this yeah. made me so happy uh i'm so glad that they're hiring this position i made my my statement that i stand behind 100 percent. i like i quote tweeted uh pete foley intentionally uh, who is obviously the head over book and box games. And like, there's a reason I quote, I, I quote tweeted him one, because I wanted him to see my exact thoughts on it. And two, because my thoughts are very positive. I think they should hone this position in and make them laser focused on execution, refinement and efficiency and focusing of the system into smoothing out the bumps. What the quality of the work we have been getting has been top notch in almost all cases, exempting, there's always these few proud nails, and they can often derail a book, whether that be the points being incorrect when they come out, or a unit being out of whack, or having too many, you know, like being a bad design. The The books are 95, 98% fantastic. The problem is it only takes one rotten apple to spoil the bunch, right? And this role should be laser focused on achieving a product of the highest quality. Okay. As somebody who does this professionally, like this is my normal day job, you don't get to just say, 
well, this defect that would block entire workflows or cripple a user in the system is just okay because 99.8% of the program works fine. That's true. But we that like you cannot let the problem is there's been too many Sev one and Sev two defects going out the door in books. And this person should be absolutely laser focused in on that. Right? That's the quality that we want to see. And you're so close. You're so close. And I, for one, uh, think this person has a big job ahead of them, but I wish them all the best. Uh, whoever, yep. whomever they may be. Absolutely. I'm, I'm stoked that this is going to exist. And uh, I think that uh, it, it's something that we've talked about a long time. And I'm excited that, um, that, that it's getting the attention that it needs. Yeah. Yep. Martin, um, any thoughts? You applying, yeah. Martin? Um, no, I look forward to saying <laughs> hi to them when I'm on vacation at Warhammer World. Absolutely. Uh, regardless if it's if it's someone I know on this side of the pond or otherwise. Uh, yeah, I, I they should let people they should let if they really want top talent for this they should let someone do it remotely. They need to expand. Uh, they need to relax their their B and Nottingham policy. Let me just say yeah, that. they they used to have like a U.S. studio, but this is like already almost before I was in the hobby and like when I was a kid in like the mid 2000s, like they had like a US studio, like, yeah. And, and but yeah, it's already decades ago that yeah, so much has changed. COVID should have taught them that they don't need people in the building to do this role. I mean, the, I work with multiple teams set like who are literally all over the world and uh, we do it every day and it's just fine. Uh, technology is amazing it is yeah. it's really great and uh i appreciate Frank that boobs is, yeah, he is, he is inciting insurrection <laughs> <laughs> um no there there is one more news item if we if we actually like i don't know if we care or not um the the broken rum story yeah go for it go ahead what's no 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 i mean which one I, the joust I, that's the last one i read was there a new one uh the, the opr one yeah the they're joust. playing fake chess yeah yeah, it was okay. It was fine. That was it. There's my there's my read of it. It was fine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just, didn't that guy die? <laughs> I I don't remember. <laughs> it's been a long it's week. Fine. I mean, they are dead people, yeah. so it's fine. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was okay. Uh. Mm -hmm. The yes. So we all look forward to welcoming Tom to the developer role, who I'm sure will be submitting his application, uh, in short order. And in, and in no way would have any kind of headwind against him for getting such a position. I'm just <laughs> going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else? Any other new stuff we got here, Tom? Uh, no, I think that's it. All right. News complete. Uh, I got to bring up my timestamps while we go to the next, uh, while we go to the next item. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, let's talk uh, some pick of the week, guys. Uh, so, Martin, what would you like to share with everybody? Um, I have two picks. One, because it would be just um, irresponsible of me to not plug the event that I'm volunteering to help run. Um, so that would be the Atlantic City Open. Um, tickets, I believe, are almost sold out. I don't have the exact numbers. I talked to Reeson... Uh, kicker at Frontline, like every, every few days to keep an eye on like where we are with numbers. Um, and it's it's still like catch as catch can. Uh, like it's it's tough. Like someone has to be like first um, in terms of like first coming back for events. Sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're keeping an eye on guidelines for like who can come into the state. Um, but things, things are def definitely trending in the right direction. Um, there's a link on Facebook, the Atlantic City Open, specifically for Age of Sigmar, which I am the TO for. Um, big thanks to uh, Sean Feather of the Basement Wargamers Club out of Philadelphia, who is um, providing judge experience, um, BCP help, and all that jazz. And my parents, who are also going to be volunteering to help out and, and like just herd cats as needed. Um, so it's June 11th to the 13th. Uh, we are only going to be doing a two-day event this year, like a five-round sort of just standard tournament. Um, so on like the 12th and 13th at Harris Resort in um, Atlantic City, uh, there will be prize support both provided by Frontline Gaming as well as yours truly. Um, we currently have the cap at 60 players. Again, we're close to 
selling out on that. I do not have an exact number. Um, and I, uh, if there is sort of like an opening, like if it, as, as restrictions change, possibly as we get closer to the event where people get vaccinated, um, uh, there, there may be an opening of spots. I can't, can't vouch for that. So it's like, if you're thinking about it, um, there's generally like generous, like, uh, cancellation policies on, uh, especially on the hotel, which is going to be more than more, more ticket price. Like I just reserved my hotel, uh, this evening, uh, just for, so I can stay the night and, and help run the event. Um, and I believe I can cancel up to 72 hours in advance, which is pretty good. Um, and that's so my first pick was ACO second pick, which, um, uh, uh, an artist um, on Twitter and Instagram. Her name's Paulina um, on uh, Twitter um, as I think it's Polly, P O L I 9 A N D R. If you will, it's just like an underscore. Uh, she It'll is, be linked uh, down there, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, she is an artist out of Russia and truly one of the more interesting Warhammer fan artists I've ever seen because her medium varies so widely uh recently she did a watercolor she scanned a watercolor picture of skagrot the loon king and you can tell it's watercolor on canvas and it just looks amazing nice. um she's she has also been helping me bring my homebrew lumineth house to life as i posted today um pictures of the uh the heroes uh that she, she's done for me um she actually she she's so curious about the lore because she's like she dabbles in all aspects of warhammer properties but like fantasy, the fantasy side is new to her. And she, when, when she takes like a job, uh, she asks if you can provide like a little bit of backstory and the more, the better. She just, she just gobbles it up. She's really eager and curious. And um, if you're not following her work, uh, please do so. Uh, she is out this week having some sort of, um, I think some uh, uh, surgery for her eyes. She had like an eye condition. Um, and I hope she, she recovers quickly from that. And she's just doing fantastic work. Nice. I'll link it down below. Yeah. All right. Tom, what do you got, buddy? Uh, I'm going to spruik a uh, friend of the show, AOS Coach. Yes. Um, Coach did a, a nice little tight video on what is a triumph. And I, I appreciated it. And so I want you to check it out. It's A lot of it is just uh, Coach just kind of talking about this, this little corner of our game, right? And triumphs are important because they actually end up showing up in like rule books as part of battle tomes for stuff like KO. So um, it's uh, I appreciate it. It was a nice kind of like overview video of an area of the game that not a lot of people have a not a lot of knowledge about. Fantastic. Uh, I'll stay on brand for tonight, which is uh, my pick tonight is going to be for the Cult of Paint, uh, Henry and Andy. <laughs> who uh, Andy recently put up a really great video about his Lumineth Realm Lords that he's working on. Uh, and it has links out to how to paint them and stuff like that in it. But that's not what the video itself is about. The video mm -hmm. itself is about the challenge of painting an army. And Andy is one of the best painters in the world. I mean, he's an absolutely incredible artist. And it he goes through the challenge he's had with painting this army. Just literally sitting down and putting the time in for him. Somebody who paints, you know, basically every day who does incredible work, who wins Golden Demons, and yet still finds it very difficult to just put in the time to paint an army. And I thought it was really awesome the way he shared kind of the challenge that he's had with it and, you know, the, the tricks that he has and where he finds the motivation and, and, and the blocks that he has. I highly recommend watching it. If you've ever felt like you have problems finishing your army and you're alone or that, like, artists of a certain level just don't have this, it's nonsense... Um, absolutely check out this video. It is uh, absolutely illuminating, I think, into into how everybody at every level of the hobby uh, has those challenges and how you can overcome them. So there you go. He also put up a, bu a bunch of good Luminous tutorials as part of the Cult of Paint YouTube channel. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, and that video has the links out to those. So that's why this is like a really great starter video because hopefully it motivates you over your painting block and then you can just go straight to the tutorials for how to do sweet Lumineth if you get inspired by the show tonight. Uh, all right, awesome. Uh, so let's uh, let's go to some hobby time, guys. All right, hobby time. Martin, what are you working on, man? 
All right, so um, I have been working on uh, some spearmen and archers. Um, that's going to come up at least a little bit on camera. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just like a little bit. I'm not going to be able to finish them tomorrow because I um, just want to get them painted enough that they can uh, be glued to their painted bases and go in my figure case so I can use them like in games instead of them being like on wine corks and stuff. I am taking them out to um, my own version of VinciCon. Uh, hanging out with uh, Strength Hammer himself, Chuck Moore, uh, playing games, uh, staying safe out out, out at um, his humble abode. Uh, yeah, and just and making up for lost time, as it were. Uh, so that's that's generally what I've been working on. And as soon as those are done, I will get to uh, the rest of my Lumineth army. I have like a few lists I want to kind of build towards. Um, and I do have a deadline now of, even though I'm going to be the TO, for Summer Slaughter, uh, the first event that I will be playing in is in uh, mid-August called Summer Slaughter. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's also run by the Basement War Gamers, and I'd like to try and have a fully painted army for that event. Nice. Nice. That's the goal. Tom, what have you been working on, brother? Uh, putting my Night Haunt away and moving back to my KO. Okay, we're back to, we're back to the Dwarves again. That's all right. I just... Uh, I like I. Uh, I have a lot of projects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my hobby ADD is real. Sure. Um, and so uh, I've been working on some KO, and it's been good. Okay. Uh, for myself, uh, I finished up my twin souls. I've got ten twin souls all ready to go. Uh, so there's one of them right there. They're in that same. Uh, scheme as the rest of my mortal slanesh. Uh, only the I have basically the big boy left. Gludos is sitting back there. Once he's done, that's basically the last unit that I actually have right now. Although I did order a unit, order a unit of the uh, kangaroos that I'm going to turn into slick blade seekers that I'm going to uh, pervert and bring over to the land of slanesh just for a second unit of those. Uh, which I think will be just a fun little conversion project sometime I can do just for for the laughs. Um, but what I'm in, mean, so got them, those 10 twin souls took forever. I am never going to paint them again, but I'm betting hard on twin souls, betting hard on them. Good, solid unit of 10, nice unit. Uh, I'm just betting on them coming down like 50 points and then they will be a good unit. And I'm ready to go. So I'll be, I'll be planning for the future meta. Uh, then I'm just, but I'm working on some tutorials and stuff this week. And, uh, and then, then it'll be time to crack into the fat boy, the centerpiece old Gludos himself, uh, who will not, Gludos will not be appearing in this film. It'll be a different model, but that's okay. All right. So, speaking of Fallen Elves, let's talk about Lumineth Realm Lord, shall we? Gentlemen, are you ready? You ready I'm to great. talk about this? All right. So, Lumineth Realm Lords 2021. Before we get into the presentation, yes, of course, we have a presentation. Like, of course we do. Come on now. Right? I want to just start with some high-level views. Martin, we're going to start with you. You're the guest. Yeah. What's your um, first of all, I would like to point to, I, um, I'm bad at searching through my own tweets, but there was a tweet, I think, right after Broken Realms Techlist was announced. And it's like just a prelude before we get into parsing like the, the, the positives and negatives. Um, I'm glad this exists. Um, there was a point in time where I thought uh, Games Workshop was kind of washed their hands of High Elves, as ridiculous as uh, those may think, given where we are now. Um, I'm, I'm glad this exists, um, because the alternative would be like, we only have evil elves and wicked, uh, like, just, it's, it's nice to have this. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, uh, there, there's some soaring highs and surprising, unfortunate lows, but I don't think that changed that this is an, a robust book with a lot of good tools. Um, and um, I, th I think that's the best way to put just like the high notes, because everything else I have in terms of my own notes on it are probably best saved for when we're parsing certain things. Sure. I think I'll leave it at that. Let me, let me do answer a question that came up in the comments that's real important which is, is this going to contain any spoilers from the lore? No. 
No. no, there will be zero spoilers tonight. We are not talking about the lore. Yeah. Next week's show is going to be about Broken Realms, Techless, the other armies, and we will cover the narrative next week at the end of the show, and it will be tagged, and you will know it's coming. There will be no spoilers or yeah. anything of that kind tonight. If, if I may add, um, the lore that's um, that's unrelated to the actual narrative of Broken Realms that's added into... Because um, like if you buy Broken Realms, Techless, because I have it on my phone, these are like pages that are just slotted in to the full Lumineth tome. Right. Um, it does feel like a truly robust faction now, regardless of those narrative events. So um, I, I, I think that's just the, the best way to put it. Like you can pick up uh, Battle Tome Lumineth Realm Lords and not have Broken Realms Techless spoiled for yourself. Right. Yep. Totally fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tom, tell us about your over like high level with the second release. What do you think of the army, and uh, why are you now getting into the army and playing it? Um, if I know that uh, a lot of my critique up until this point has focused on the aesthetics of the uh -huh. army. Sure. Um, if you'll remember back to our first review of the first battle tome, one of my critiques, my critique of the the reason why, like the aesthetics, you can fix ultimately but that's just conversions that's just hobbying that's sure. fine um my critique was that it was too like monolithic like it was too unidirectional mm -hmm. in how the design was uh, you either had to spam archers and spearmen or you and all you know cows and hammers um and ni neither of those play styles really interested me and so that's why i said initially it i'm not going to do the book because it's too unidimensional um, that is something I cannot say anymore. Sure. Uh, this is one of the most robust, busy, and I, I mean that both positively and in some sense in a, as a critique of any of the battle times we've seen in recent history. Yep. It's playing in every phase. It can do that in multiple ways. It's very reminiscent in that sense of like old school... Uh, like turn of edition stormcast like moving into second edition right when we got the stormcast like the new uh sequiturs and all the wizards and everything because stormcast were suddenly playing in every phase again mm -hmm. sure. right and and very much this book feels that way it's playing in all the phases it has lots of toys lots of options lots of build permutations um, and as a Johnny style player, I love that. Like, so like, I love having options. I go out a list, um, right when I got my hands on the book and immediately, like, I fell in love with the list. And the irony is that like, it has no duplicate units, right? It has like eight war scrolls or nine war scrolls or something silly and zero duplicate units. Um, and I love that. Like, I loved what it gave me. And so from a rule standpoint, I'll say that it's amazingly diverse. Um, and it's in the mental, um, the mental load on the player is very high. Yeah. That would be my critique. Yep. Um, but, uh, but I think that it's uh, more than I think it's ever been. It will be a true powerhouse competitively. Okay. All right. I, I agree with all of that, but I think for my summary, I will say that I think they did a mostly good job. There are some elements of bad design and NPE in here, and I think the thing I would reiterate, Tom, is that I think the skill floor on this army is the highest skill floor we've ever seen, and that, yeah. as I'm about to say, this is the first uh, blue, blue control army we've ever had. So with that, let's get into that sweet PowerPoint, shall we? Yeah! Ooh! Let's get that PowerPoint going. There we go. That's what we all came for. We came for that sweet, sweet PowerPoint action. All right. So, because it's going to sum up my thoughts. Here's sort of my army overview, because I'm like i the one who wrote the PowerPoint. So, there you go. Okay. To me, this is a very high skill floor elite army that can play in all faces. The first real blue control army we've seen in Age of Sigmar. Things I've already said. Yeah. Uh, by that, for those not familiar with Magic the Gathering... Famously, blue is the color of control. It is uh, a color. It is a a blue deck wins. It's a classic. We'll talk about that in just a moment. 
but it is an army that is all about interfering with your opponent's plans as much as it is about advancing any plan of your own. Right. I get to play with my toys. You don't get to play with your toys. Correct. Uh, strengths, it is definitely a magic dom, whether it be through techless or other potential avenues. It has extremely high mobility now, which was a weakness before, but that has moved over into a different column for lots of different reasons, but the Huracan being chief among them. It definitely has power projection. It can be, whether it be techless or sentinels or the ballisty or whatever, uh, it can absolutely disrupt the enemy's plans. It has very strong enemy disruption. It does have solid defenses. Uh, those can be ramped up, especially if you're in something like Sire. Uh, it does have lots of unique tech pieces and capabilities. Of, like, there are multiple abilities in this army that no other army in the game has. No other scroll anywhere has, which is interesting. And you can get lots and lots of command points. That was unexpected. But hey, there's that new. That's new. Surprise. Yeah. Weaknesses, it is a very complicated army. And if you play wrong, you can lose. Right. Right. Um you don't really have any true hammer in the army probably the closest is like 30 wardens jacked up on their their uh their spell i mean that's a pretty good hammer avalonor fully yeah. buffed up like not losing profile like he can do some work even those guys are still yeah. pretty easy to disrupt like yes yeah. at, like the mountains can be very swingy yes it is hard to get them off of their top profile you're absolutely right but there's nothing in this army that you can just go like, that's definitely going to remove the thing in front of me. Uh, right? I mean, archers, like a huge block of 30 wardens, if you want to. No, uh, it's, 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 even it's sentinels aren't going to get there. I, I, I still I, do the damage. Yeah, no, I, 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 th I think what, what he's getting at is um, someone can't look at an army list and say, that's going to um, extinguish whatever it charges. Correct. And sure. That's, yeah, yeah, sure. That's exactly what you yeah, Thank you, Mark. There's, yeah, perfect there's, no, there's no Hearth Guard Berserker unit here. There's no Hearthguard Berserker. There's no Ghoul King on Terror Geist. There's no Mega Boss on Maw Crusher or you know Unit of Six Pigs ramped up with a with a uh, a, a, a go in lads get stuck in and a, and a War Channer buff right or or whatever. Pick your pick your explosive unit that generally in this game like there are units in this game that you can just shoot at things and be like nothing will survive this right sure. right like because they're so they're so pushed down to like hit on twos, re-rolling ones, off, you know, sometimes causing mortal wounds, sometimes not, you know, sometimes piling in multiple times, blah, 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 all the things that make hammers hammers, right? And, uh, and that just doesn't exist here. That isn't to say they can't hit hard. There are certainly units in this that can hit hard. I completely agree. You, you mentioned the mountain. You mentioned, we talked about 30 wardens. They're there, right? <laughs> But they're both, one of the interesting things about those is those are both fairly slow, right, comparatively. Right. Right. Okay. So, every, both of you agree with my well, my overview? Have I said it? I think I'm agreeing with yeah, both of your points. I would agree with your that. points. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, as just a quick, let's, we, we'll, we'll hit on power later. I think this is one of the top performing armies in the meta right now i would put this in like the top six or so armies okay sure. as far as its capabilities and what it would do i think it is powerful it is not beyond but it, i would put it at like number five or six i think right, that right, things right. like seraphon are still beating it probably doc are still beating it you know like i think there are there are multiple armies we could get into the argument of exactly what's above it on average, but I think those would be above it. Martin, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, we generally have accepted sort of um, stats for for how we track like like win rates and whatnot. And yeah. I think with an army like this, more so than than any other, it's important not just to look at win percentages, because when we do return to events, um, and because of the high skill requirement for an army like this um people may see the army overall at a lower end win rate but then see it put it like um reaching top tens or higher yeah because mm -hmm. because it will be i don't want to use the term dragged down but that's literally what is going to be happening 
No, one you're would expect if you looked in the data, you'd see a bifurcated win pattern determined yes. by player skill. Is, is what I, yes, there we a go. reverse bell curve. But player skill is probably way more determinative of how this army performs than a lot of other armies. Yeah, um, spoiler, that's it's highly determinative at. anyways. Tune in in two weeks to learn more. Anyways. Uh... Stop. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. We'll talk about that later. Um, but... Uh, what what I would say is that um, it's a lot. It's not like Daughters of Cain, right? Daughters of Cain, like I could just be like, go, go, my pretties, and just push them forward, and they kill everything they touched. Yeah. Um. And so, but with this army, I think that it's it's really going to matter who's be, who's piloting it. Yes, and it will respond very well to high skill players. So Matt in the chat asked, "Is it really high skilled though?" When so many things happen for almost free, yes, a thousand percent, because. This army is actually rather fragile. It doesn't tend to have a huge number of bodies. Like if you if you position things badly, if you use your pennies at the wrong time, if you fail to cast your, the spells you need or in the right order that you need, if you fail to sort of have your right tech pieces acting in the way they do, it will fall apart on you. Like that's the challenge. Now, a highly skilled player that manipulates all of these levers in the right way is going to play a very hard to beat symphony. Okay, right. like when Mozart rocks up on this piano, uh, it is going to be a really, really, really powerful song, right? Uh, and and will be robust and will be able to to take hits and all that kind of stuff, right? Because it's, they will it, have already done everything. They will be using all of their tools in exactly the right way to weaken, disrupt, and depower your army and your plans. And that yeah. is why NPE with a bullet is the last item, because this army will drive players insane. Insane. Regardless of I its love, overall power. I love with the new book we've just resolved that um that Dark Sun of Doom, I forget what it's called. Um it, Total Eclipse. Total Eclipse. Uh yeah. Total Eclipse is just simply a feature of the army now. Yeah. Like it's not a spell on their list. It's a mm -hmm. it's an army feature yeah. that they're just gonna rotate through with sure. two wizards. Yeah, sure. You can absolutely <laughs> do that. Yeah, I one of the first things I did when I built a list, which I, I had to I'll have to I'd have to change the list somehow because it wasn't exactly legal, but that's fine. Um for, for reasons we'll talk about later. But you could build a very different version of it that is legal that I, I shared with you, Tom, the legal version. Yeah. And it's called yeah. How to Lose I think Friends. I saw that one too, yeah. Yeah, how to lose friends and alienate people. Okay. Yeah, just right. like the worst. And, and people will run that kind of thing. Right. And right. it will and be you know horrible what? to play against. And they're going to win. And people are going to hate every minute of it. It'll be like when, Vince, you walked away from the table when we matched up at an event. And you're just like, finish your turn. I'm right. Done. Yeah. <laughs> we're, uh, we're gonna we're play touch. <laughs> yeah, with a stupid yeah. play touch army, yes. Oh, God. Yeah, like, that's the point. I, I, arguably, here's the thing. Even if you lose, like, even if, the, that is to say, even if the opponent wins, if they beat the LRL... It's <laughs> They will it's often be walk away going, yay, I won. That game was terrible. That's a real challenge in this army because that's the classic. That's why I say this is a blue deck. Blue decks. Well, and that's. Yeah. Keep going. That that like a blue or what what's now basically like a mid range. Like I hate playing those decks because it's just boring. Right. Like we, I like because what their game plan is, is to make you do nothing until they get their win condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that, like that's their game plan. And this this army is not a lot different right yep okay let's let's get into it we'll we'll we'll, we'll got a yep. lot of slides yeah we do let's let's talk about why i think there's such a high skill floor this is going to directly answer that question so there is a large number of once per game abilities okay uh more than a dozen sprinkled throughout the book in the war scrolls and various other things abilities that can only be triggered once per game that is a large number of things you have to remember to use and using them at exactly the right moment, holding them, keeping the pieces safe until you can use them till maximal effect requires a pretty decent amount of skill. Like when you can pop a thing once and it needs to be in the right combat or the right thing to swing the game, you know, get it wrong. You, you're, you're done for, right? Many abilities have multiple triggered layers in addition as has been off joked is like the most commonly written two words in this book, 
Like, yeah. the number of abilities that are like, it does this fairly obvious thing. Okay. In addition, right, this other stuff also that seems completely unrelated got jacked into this yeah. rule because we realized that if we just actually wrote them all out as individual rules, it would look like every scroll had 18 different abilities. So instead, we just squish them together and call it in addition. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Many of your abilities are either used during an enemy player's turn, during their actions, are directly affecting their actions, are, you know, like, are they're off turn. It's classic blue deck, like, draw a card, tap nothing, your turn. Draw go. <laughs> right? Like, you got a lot of this type of stuff. Okay? Um, some units can be fragile if not protected, used properly. Like, this is the Sentinel conundrum, right? Like, Sentinels are super powerful. No doubt about it. They're amazing. But like if you don't protect them properly and you let some and you let those those even like three pigs or six pigs come screaming into them, you might as well just pick that unit up. They're gone. And just just one pig, really. Sure. Like they're gonna get blown right off the board. Like that's not a challenge at all, right? They can't penny themselves out of that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what all that amounts to is that every resource in this book has to be used at the right time for maximum effect. Which is why I say uh, a really high skill player that is that is like, you know, really dancing on the keys of this army, it's going to be terrible to play against. Seem right, gentlemen? Did I miss anything there? Um, no, yeah, I, I, I um, it's it's a it's a mind game for both for both parties. Because I've seen other reviews um, constantly say, well, like, imagine this thing in CR. Imagine this thing with Aether Quartz up or something like that. And it's like almost the the war, the war scroll you're reading is almost constantly in flux. When I walk up to the table at an event and show someone my army list, they will have to understand that basically everything in the army can have the stat or ability changes combined with interrupts, reactions. And it's like it's not going it, – it does not do what it says on the cover. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's... And and so Matt said, I feel like high memorization versus tedious. First of all, those aren't mutually exclusive. You can have both. Like that's a false dichotomy. Number one. Number two, I agree with you. Boc is a high skill floor army. I actually do think Beast of Chaos is a high skill floor army. The problem is, it's a high skill floor just because you have to use every piece in exactly the right way because you're on a knife edge or you just die. Right? Because the army has like is is a bunch of people made of paper with a bravery negative four. Right. Yeah, um, they're made of paper until I say they're not for a little while, and, and that then, could be key. Yeah, this army, you look at something, think of the very simple choice that is literally like the basic function of this army that's probably too good, but there it is, and that's Aether Quartz, right? We're not even going to put it in Sire. Every unit has one penny. When and what you use that penny on, using it for the right spell at the right time on your wizard or the right unit in the right phase to get the right save to stay alive for one round when you need it to, to move the numbers, right? Knowing when you're getting attacked. All of that stuff is the skill I'm talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Aether Quartz isn't a fire and forget thing. It can turn the game when used properly, and it can be nothing when you use it wrong. Yeah. Right? Like... Low skill players will rock up in this army. They'll look at their Aether Quartz. They'll get a big charge with their wardens. They'll pop the plus one to hit and be like, "Yay!" And they'll chop the crap out of something. And that and they they will have killed that unit. And that will be completely irrelevant to that to the winning of that game. Right, right. And in the end, the extra like five six wounds you did because of that plus one to hit didn't matter at all. Right, right, right. Because you've just misused that resource. That's my point. Right? Okay. Nope. Sorry. Yeah, it's a control army. It's blue deck wins. Right? Yep. That's what this is. You're putting up things that are going to disrupt their movement, or, or in some kind of ways. You're using your units to disrupt them. You're using your spells to disrupt them. You're using every... Like, you're, you're firing off total eclipse every round to keep them so they can't use their command points. Right? Right. Like, right. That's, that's this army. It's blue deck wins. And Penal penalties to hit. Yeah, penalties to hit everywhere. This army loves a neg one to hit. If you're fighting Lumineth and you don't have neg one to hit, I I don't know what's going on. They They're not doing their somewhere. job. Yeah. Right. Right. 
line of sight, that doesn't matter. If you're hiding behind rocks, they're going to shoot. Like, they're going to ignore the rules and do what they need to do to win. Yeah. Uh, so, so TP Grant said, I watched this exact thing happen at a game store last weekend. A new LRL player didn't understand the army and got rinsed. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll believe that absolutely. Right? Yep. And the the trick with that is it's like if you win when you know we you tom you and i played magic for years and years and if you hand yep. somebody brand new to magic or newer to magic a control deck it's hilarious right yeah, they're like you can steam this is terrible i hate this right yeah. because it's just it's you, they, like you you have to know you have you have a limited number of resources and you need to disrupt the most important things they do right right that's what it is it's a blue deck wins right and they, it, it is is truly resource management Yep. Is how you win with this army. Yep. Which is why I hate it and would never play this army. This is the opposite of the army of type I enjoy. I don't like play. I don't like. I, I don't like playing against it, and I don't like playing. I would never play it or pilot it. Uh, yeah. Well, they have my attention. Not uh, sure. And this I hope. Is... I hope. I hope you f don't feel bad when we eventually have our rematch. No, of course not. I'll be happy, Martin. I would play you with any army you wanted to bring to the table, buddy. You're, it's always very much fun playing you, Martin. So yes. Thank you. Me, on the other hand, Vince no. would pass. Yeah, Tom, that's a hard pass. I'll play Martin <laughs> twice. That's what I'll do. Tom will rock up, and I'll be like, "No, go leave. I'm going to play Martin again." There you go. I'll okay. Flip that. So, uh, all right. So let's actually get into the meat of this thing. Right. Uh, allegiance abilities. So there's no new generic abilities other than the two sub factions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which you're a new Sonari ability. I have no idea if I spelled any of these words right. Like I think I did, but I'm I probably I, I checked. You're good. Oh, awesome! Thank you. <laughs> I was just I was literally doing those words off of memory, and I'm terrible at that. So hey, there you go. And it's not like I, it's not like PowerPoint's going to tell me it's wrong, right? No. Good yeah. job. Okay, so Sonari. Now we have Sonari are your your wizard folks, like your Sonari Cathalar and your, uh, yeah, those people. Paintbrush guy and Paintbrush uh, Loremaster. Guy. Yep, exactly. And and the twins. The, and twins, the twins are also oh, yes, Sonari. Yeah. So all yeah. those four people have this ability called Contemplate, wherein they can choose to not cast a spell for a round, and then the next magic phase they can auto cast a single spell on a nine. Okay. What that should read is they will auto cast total eclipse next round. Next, next round. round, yeah. You just take two of these guys. One of them's always contemplating. One of them's not, and they just total eclipse off every round. And so you may get a spell. You may be able to spend command points turn one, but after that, if you can't unbind them, you will no longer be able to use command points in that game. Or, or at least very rarely and to not well like yeah them. yes yeah. like you'll you'll be at double cost i'm being flippant when go. i say you don't you can't use them but yeah, yeah. uh you will be heavily taxed so it's like death and taxes it is like death and taxes which is a deck i played <laughs> anyways which is funny uh at any rate uh and then the huracan which is your uh your new monkey king wind rider the flying foxes and the uh the wind riders uh, their ability is they can pile in any direction. When they pile in, they get three extra inches, and they can fly when they pile in. Uh, a single rule that breaks three rules. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, three! I really, yeah, three rules. Um, I do not like this, Sam I am. Uh, this is way too many rules broken. I, I don't mind the plus three inches in the fly. I think that's what they should have stopped at. Honestly, yeah. like if that had been the thing, I would have been fine. That would have been correct. That would have felt right. Like because they yeah. then they could jump way around things and stuff like that. And the uh, the but the pile in any direction opens up so much jank. Like and and we, like we'll we'll get into the jank later of of really exploring just how gross this can be. But right. the fact that you you can just go whatever direction you want. And, by the way, all these guys have three-inch range weapons, right? So they can always just, like, come into you, to, you complete the charge, and then pile out to the three-inch line. So at minimum, they're, they're, like, at bare mins, they're completely minimizing how many of the enemy gets to fight them back. Right, right? because they can pull all back, if they wanted to, all back but one model at the three-inch mark. 
and make it so you can only get one to three models into that one model. Right. And they can do that forever because right. they just just keep doing it every right. turn. Yeah. Uh, and that's and that's a and that's a best case scenario for you. It can be worse. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> is like could be so much worse. Yeah. On this slide, I have my editor's note. My editor's note is that with the addition of Sonari and Huracan, and, and now all of the, the individual types, Venari, Sonari, Huracan, and Alarith, having their own rules, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the only, like, this, that means Lumineth have a type bonus set of rules, like Skaven, Gits, and BOC, right? Yep. They have uh, strong generic allegiance abilities, like the best books, like Aether Quartz and Fight, with two units instead of one every time they activate. Like, very yep. strong allegiance abilities. And full sub-faction rules. Yeah, they have three layers of free rules. Correct. They are the only book... There's only one other book that has sort of this. And they're actually missing this middle piece. Okay? Which is strong generic allegiance rules. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And that's BOC. Which is ironic, right? Um... But my point being is that there are three different layers of rules laid down on every scroll in this book. Yeah. It's, okay. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, from, yeah. from a list building standpoint. Yes. That's what I'm saying. I, it's, it makes them unique. Like Skaven have typified rules and pretty good allegiance abilities, right. but no sub-factions. Right? Right. Gits sort of have typified rules under the Bad Moon, effectively, right? Like, eh. yeah. And then they don't yeah. really have sub factions unless you're like doing an all in goofy army, right? Like, right. like, uh, you know, Maws of the Jork Spider or something army. like that, or the Spider yeah. Army. Again, not those are bad. I think Maws of Jork is one of the greatest armies in the history of Warhammer, and <laughs> everybody should be playing Maws of Jork. Um, but like, my point is. They nailed all three of those layers. Their sub-factions are good, their basic legions are good, and their typified rules are good. And every one of those things stacks on every unit in the game. And I'm not even talking, like, battalions, of course, like normally you could lay on there, too. Right? Yeah. No other no, books it's, have it's, that level. It, it is an impressive level of depth where they... they um, I, I, I know it's... Uh, narrative is not as important to, like, sort of, like, bake into the design, but it... it it rewards you for um, they've taken almost every aspect of how they wrote this the society of elves and then just like so this cast does this this cast does that and then these nations have these own traits and how they perform and then you have the the um, bigger umbrella beyond that of here's everything that that um, Illumineth as as a, a an army have access to right and yeah, yeah. it's um, I, I don't know if we want something that involved for for every like army mm -hmm. because I think that would probably get a little noisy, but possibly baking in um, the options in some other fashion, like a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, I'll give you my honest answer, and then I want to hit a comment real quick. They shouldn't have all these rules. Okay. They just shouldn't. Yeah. It's that easy. They just shouldn't. Okay. Like they overwrote this book. Yes. Like, there's a layer that needs to not be here. I don't yeah. know what that layer is. So either the sub-factions, or the generic rules, or the, typified like... Typified rules. The, the, the typified type rules. rules. Yeah. The type rules. One of those three layers needs to not be there. They, and I'm okay, And it's actually okay if they, like, each book they release, they want to clump these. Like, I, two, yeah, I think if they move to War... Them. If they move them to War Scrolls, I think... Like some of these bonuses, like especially sure, well, the Alarith, like the Alarith especially, it's like some of the stuff should just be on these War Scrolls because sure. now it's um, only like Yometrica in general. Before we get to like the sub factions, it's like that now only affects ten percent of the army. Right. And some sub factions yeah. only affect that much, but I think some of these rules, if you just move them to this is like the Mountain Stance, it's like you can choose to be in Mountain Stance. That hasn't there's not another stance. I mean Stone Mage. But like you don't, they are not mutually exclusive stances. You could just move those to the three war scrolls that needs to be on, and you're done. Right. Yeah, my honest right. answer is yeah. this whole army has too many rules. <laughs> like right. there are just actually that was that was true before too. 
like on Stone Mountain Man, there's that ridiculous set of rules about like if he's near a character and then the character doesn't move and or he doesn't yes. move and they end up in the next hero phase being X inches away from each other, then like that somebody can use a command ability for free and I'm just like, what kind of ridiculous mousetrap Rube Goldberg <laughs> situation do I need to execute yeah. on here to make this happen? Like that entire, again, if somebody had handed me that set of rules, I would have been like, no, <laughs> cut this. I got, okay. I, yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. Um, now as to like, somebody had asked up above, like how do new players deal with this? Could this be a bad time for people? Yeah. But we'll talk about ways that I think this, you can, you can push on this army. We will talk about some ways to beat it. My, my, Hope is that it's not too toxic. I guess time will tell on that. I it'll be interesting to do another NPE show at some point, you know, next year, and and see what it's like. Um, you know, like it's it's a question. I don't know. It's it's not that they're unbeatable. It's that they're probably not going to give a good game under a lot of circumstances, especially the less skilled well, players. The the thing that I struggle with is that like if you're not like the mental load for a LRL player is real. Okay. That said, I don't know how I prep my opponent for the game they're about to have. Sure, if they're not familiar with the army and its capabilities. Right. Well, what does your army do? Well. <laughs> a yeah. lot. Just a lot. Like so much. More than I can explain to you. Right? Right. Like that I could, could be hand a topic out for a show. Yeah, I like, could hand out an entire like cheat sheet of everything I can do in every phase, and their eyes would just glaze over. Like, so I don't know how non specialists of this army are supposed to expect to play it and be not know that you're not cheating, right? Like, <laughs> sure, I'll use this ability like, and then do this other thing, and also this happens, and now all and you of my losses now. are now your losses, and you have this penalty. And it's like, wait, what happened? Yeah. Go ahead. Per <laughs> no, I was going to say, per perhaps that could be like a topic for a show on Sunrise, like like um, yeah. sort of that pre-game discussion. Yeah. Like even yeah. like even at an event, like it's it's. I mean, when I'm uh, playing my Iron Jaws, right? Like, here's the pre-game discussion, right? Okay, everything in my units hits like a truck, and I can be anywhere on the board I want at any point in time. That's what's right. going to happen. I have unbelievable mobility, and when I show up, I'm going to blow up whatever I touch. So you may want to chaff accordingly. Okay, these little guys make me do more damage. These guys hit real hard and go real fast. Right, right. Then that's about it. Like, like you got it. That's what Iron Jaws does, baby. That's the army. I just summarized the whole thing. Okay. Uh, but with this, you're going to be like, okay, so these units, these three, pile in an extra three inches. They don't have to pile in towards the enemy, and they fly when they do that. These wizards, in addition to everything on their war scroll, can auto, can forego their spell and cast on a nine on the next turn if they didn't cast this turn. And also this one can steal bravery from my units and give it to your units and then also make you take the losses because that's all the same character. Right. And then yeah. all of them can do so, this or this or this or this. But when I do that, I take a penalty to bravery. So, but so when I take a penalty to bravery, I can give that to you because of this character. <laughs> So what you're telling me is it's it's someone's job, and I'll say maybe it's my job to go out there and 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 f and find a way to summarize what a Lumineth army does. You're gonna have to prepare people. Otherwise, yeah. what you're gonna do is you're gonna generate bad experiences. Yeah. yeah. Because it's gonna be like you know when when you were a kid and you were playing like I don't know like army soldiers. You know like the little old monopose army soldiers, and like you'd set up and. Pow, pow, maybe it's just me. Um, and you'd be playing with your neighbor friend, and suddenly you're like, and then I do this. And he's like, wait, that you're not allowed to do that. And I'll be like, yeah, I am. It's in the rules. You know, like, and they're like, you're changing the rules. Well, we, the we problem is this, there's an agreed upon assumptions as to how the game plays. And Lumineth's like, nah. Right. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to pile in towards enemies. No, I don't. Command abilities call are used for one command point. No, they don't, right? Um, all this kind of stuff, yeah. So um, somebody said, can you make fun lists out of this army? Yeah, 100%. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep. The, there are a, a, like a thousand, thousand percent yes. There yeah. are absolutely lists you can make with this army that aren't packed full of NPE, that will play pretty normal Warhammer, and honestly, be pretty fun. 
they'll right, just play I... very classic high elven like stuff. Like, those lists do exist. They can be done. So you don't have to be a jerk with this army. You don't. Okay. But it incentivizes that type of play sure. because of the way the design kind of points. Sure. Of like, if you're going to use this, this is how you should use it. Yeah. But um, there are absolutely I... fun lists with this. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving. Let's talk about that uh, terrain piece as well in the Allegiance abilities, because guess what? It's shrine time. Shrine time! Oh, oh by the way, yeah. they get a terrain piece. They get a terrain piece as well, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the terrain piece is this big old floaty shrine. There are it's FAQ beautiful. questions around this thing. It is a gorgeous terrain piece. Uh, I yeah. might get one just to have it on my table, because I think it'd look really cool. It's just a generic terrain piece on the table. Um... It's set up wholly within your territory. After territories are chosen, one inch from other terrain, six inches from objectives. If you've got a, a person garrisoning it, by the way, only elves can garrison it. Only one elf character can garrison it, so you can't garrison their shrine. Take that, Seraphon, uh, <laughs> with your stupid building that the enemy can garrison. Uh, you can reroll one casting, unbinding, or dispelling roll each turn for a hero within 12 inches of it. And once a turn, the shrine guardian can uh, use a uh, command ability for free i i have so many questions which about... is like 10 free command points over the course of the game assuming yes, you yes. started garrisoned in the thing you know nine if you didn't or whatever okay i i have so many questions around how the footprint of this terrain works because of garrison this is the yes. faq yeah. question can you move under it what happens like if it's garrisoned Clearly not, because then you can't move within three inches of it, or you're in combat. So, like, that's how garrisoning terrain works normally. But what if it's right. not garrisoned, and I happen to walk under it, and then somebody garrisons it? Like, then what happens? Then can I, because I can't garrison the thing, but they could, right? I could be, like, under it on this side, then they jump in from over here, because they started wholly within six, and then garrisoned it. And then, like, now I'm technically in combat with them. Like, what is happening here? Yeah. Well, like, you could put somebody in the middle, of the legs underneath. Yeah, yeah. You can, and then, you can deploy like 20 Spearmen under that thing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of space under there. <laughs> well, I was simply going to say, then they like, you force like a six inch charge, a six to seven inch charge, because they have to start outside three inches of the waterfalls, like the footprint of the thing itself if it's garrison. Yes. And so, like, you could keep somebody in the middle protected. Like, from, like, short charges, ever. Like, they would only be able to get into those people with a long charge, which is just hilarious to me. Yeah, so, I don't know. There's a lot of FAQ questions around this terrain piece. They're going to need to write, a like, a, a lengthy response of, like, if I don't want to see the... What's going to happen is some people are going to submit some really intelligent questions, like Martin, who are going to formulate some really smart FAQ questions, and the answer and you like, get back yeah. is going to be, yes. No. <laughs> out of here it's gonna be yeah. so good no, yeah. no it, it's like and the thing is like because you can theoretically put a scenario in there which comes with its own thing where it's like well what happens with with the bodyguards and then it just it it it's a it's a glorious mess a glorious with a capital g like i i mean in the end like um a lot of the stuff can be resolved by players where it's like well what what's going on here and and they'll just say it probably does this and that's what's going to how is it going to end up being resolved but in terms of event play and and just just rules as written um and then there's the whole thing with iliatha which i don't even want to go near sure because like then then yeah. are you doubling your command points because i'm cast i'm using it for free here and then does it dupe up for free again and, right yeah Be because there are multiple command uh, there's no way around it there are, there are multiple command abilities in this army which um, are not triggered by heroes, but you need a hero on the table for those command abilities to trigger. Right now, yeah. I, I've, I've had this discussion a few times, not within the past two or three days to have the screenshots handy of of like how it's resolved. I don't know if if it, that specific aspect of it requires an FAQ, but it could be interpreted as so long as the hero that you're electing to participate in the the like the, because the weirdest thing is most of the time heroes are not using command abilities you the player are which is right. how it how it gets weird 
because the language specifically says that the Shrine Guardian can use a command ability for free. And that's where it just goes crazy. Well, yeah, so I mean, what I would say is this. Um, I wonder if we're not getting a glimpse behind the curtain of third edition. Oh, for sure. Like, not, not, maybe not with this thing specifically, but, but elsewhere in the well, book, yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe. That I, that maybe that maybe command abilities will be divorced from models predominantly. I don't know. I don't know, um, but I look but... forward to I look forward to whatever nonsense comes with command abilities in, in 3.0, which they because they change it every edition. Here's what I'll bet on: right. they're going to change, and however they change, they're going to get ten free a game. Okay, like that's what we can say. All right. Yes. I don't want to beat yeah. this all up too bad. Let's let's yeah. let's move on from the shrine. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, it is what it is. Many FAQs incoming. Stay tuned. This will not be the last time we ask for FAQs. I, I have I mentioned I love the diversity of rules in this army. Oh sure, yeah yeah sure, <laughs> I get it. All right, let's talk sub factions. New sub factions. All right. Uh, while I timestamp here for sub factions. Okay. All right, great. I like the, I like the alumni sub faction. It's like, hey, alumni. all those yeah. aluminum. No, alumni. It's for the, all the alumni elf players. Yes. All the old high elf players. All right, so let's talk about subfaction aluminia, uh, as I'm sure it'll be end up being called. <laughs> so subfaction aluminia. Uh, its generic ability is three Venari or Sonari units get a pregame normal move, which is your Venari are obviously all your sort of shining company kind of folks. And, uh, you know, your wardens and your uh, sentinels and those kinds sentinels. of people. Your traditional high elves, yep. basically. Sonari yep. are your aforementioned casters. Uh, they get a yep. full-on move. Sure. That's pretty good. Why not? Seems good. Uh, your command ability is run and charge. Your command trait is very bad, and I'm not even going to talk about it because it's not worth repeating. Uh, and, but your artifact is once per battle you can teleport uh, you get a teleport of basically 12 inches. It's, like, weirdly phrased for no reason. Um, but it's during the movement phase, and you can, like, you pick a point, and you teleport to it. So it's technically kind of a 13-inch teleport or whatever-ish, but it's fine. It's cool. It's teleport. It's perfectly fine uh, artifact. It should be noted that that uh, run and charge is um, not limited by any ranges. This right. is one of those abilities that we're talking about. It's not like a unit within 18 inches of a hero. No, it's spend a command point. Anybody anywhere on the battlefield can run in charge. Like one unit yeah. can run in charge. Yes, that's right. That's right. So like, again, this is the kind of thing that the Shrine Guardian could do, right? He could just be over there banging this drum for free, right? Right. And he, and like, it doesn't matter where the, where the unit he is that, that he's targeting is because that this doesn't put restrictions on that. Unlike many other command abilities. Right. It doesn't have to emanate from a hero within X inches. It's just somebody in your army gets to now run and charge. Go nuts. Right? Yep. Uh, Aluminia. Okay, so that's the basics. Let's talk about Aluminia. What does it do well? Uh, well, it's excellent for many battle plans to grab early it's, objectives. It's Alumnia. I, Aluminia. I'm going to keep saying it because it makes me laugh, but yes. It's fine. It's, it's fine. Mispronouncing elvish things is one of my great joys yeah. in life. Okay, so please don't ruin it for me. Oh, tr oh trust me. Like, there, there's, there's, there's this whole sections in Lord of the Rings lore videos on pronouncing words and syllables. And it's like, you're all doing it wrong. Like, yeah, well, in, that you know, was I mean, written by, by a linguist. All, I mean, anyone, I, like, anyone watching them, it's like, you're all, all Lord of the Rings fans are doing it wrong, apparently. Sure. It's fine. Uh, it allows for that early excellent board control uh it's great for easy run and charge on things like wardens to get them into the fight it's absolutely amazing with the lore seeker because you can have him drop down and then go out and send out protection units to also threaten other objectives or to bodyguard him or whatever uh i really like aluminia i really do i think this is a super potent sub faction i think it could like the fact that what that that speed, especially among heavy Venari armies, can still be a problem, right? Like you are not a very mobile force. You're relying on a lot of foot slogging folks. 
And the fact that three units can just make a full move pregame, not D3 like every everybody else. No, no, not like the rest of us plebs who get D3 units to pregame move. No, three. All three, right? So, there you go. Yeah, um, I think this is where um, you have a home in those fun, like we were talking a few minutes ago, it's like, can people still make fun armies? Uh, this is a good home for your fun armies. Um, it lets you play a little faster, lets you play a little bit more aggressively, um, and it still gives you some, like, control tricks in there with that, like, the, the lore master using the teleport item. Yeah. But, um, it, it, yeah, it lets you play a little bit more fast and loose, like, for the, for, well, let's just go faster. Like. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes wardens. Yeah. I think this is a great, uh, if you like wardens, I think this is an interesting play for them, right? Like, because... Wardens now get to start farther ahead or be in a better position, a more forward position, right? They like, they can be out there, yeah, still in shining company, right? Farther forward, uh, maybe in a more advanced position, which is nice. Like you generally want them to be out and to set the charge. Getting a whole extra turns move right at the beginning of the game is pretty good. And if you break shining company and suddenly can run and charge, that could be pretty good too, depending on what you need to do with them, right? I mean. The thing that I would add that I actually think that like is the really mo the most interesting play um, with that early move is using it with the calf because yeah. like you can you can put them wherever you want on the board. Yeah, hundred percent. Like Dawn Riders, you mean? And, yes. Yeah, like taking and taking like a block of ten, which are on a four up save, and shoving them down somebody's throat. Like I think there's a real potential for like a mobile anvil. Or just there. early holding an objective pretty hard, which forces them to come out, right? Because you're at, like, check, you're going to control the objective, even if you don't have first turn, right? Right, right. Yeah. Right. You can get to the point where your Dawn Riders have went out and claimed one thing, you've got a Lore Seeker on another, which we'll talk about him later, and, like, where you're just holding a majority of the board before they've even gone. Right, even if they go first. Right, correct. <laughs> yeah, like, it's crazy. Uh, and I would point out, like, scenario units can do that, too. So depending on the objective placement, some they might be able to literally, like, tow into the objectives and actually threaten those if they're hero-focused objectives, like places or yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is anything else on Aluminia? Good stuff. I like it. I, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I think Aluminia is strong. Uh, we'll talk about what we think compared to the existing ones after we cover the second one, so... Mm -hmm. uh let's talk about the great nation of helon helon uh helon yeah. uh generic ability plus one to attack with missile weapons used within three inches of the enemy unit so it makes you a better shooter up close uh i will all 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 win uh riders need to have their bows turned sideways because they're they're if they're in helon because they they're in there for the kill shot they're turning the gun they're shot. turning the bow sideways it's a kill shot it's a kill shot <laughs> Okay. Uh, their command ability is they allow a unit to make a normal move at the end of combat, which is going to get insane for reasons we'll talk about later. Uh, and their uh, command trait is actually quite good. Once again, you can reroll one run, reroll one charge, and reroll one casting roll, roll for the person who has it. Quite nice. Uh, one, more <laughs> three once a game abilities. By the way, when I was counting those, I counted that as one, but that's actually three distinct once a game abilities right there. Uh, and then your artifact is once per game, yet again. Uh, at the start of combat, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches, and they're neg one to hit and wound for that enemy. Uh, th that enemy is neg one to hit and wound until the end of the phase. Very, mm -hmm. very, very potent artifact. Holy Moses, that's a good artifact. Yeah. That's a spicy meet the ball. Uh, and then they also make win riders battle line. It's like it's like I got something for you, Archeon. Yeah, like. The, again, so much of this army relies on uh, using the right resource at the right time. And, like, you pop your penny and your plus one to save and you pop the artifact and your neg one, their neg one to hit and wound. Like, suddenly you're really, really, really diminishing that enemy unit's ability mm -hmm. to move you in the turn where they needed to move you. And you hold the, uh, you hold the, uh, the objective for one extra turn. Oftentimes, that's the difference between winning and losing. Okay, mm -hmm. Martin, what do you think about uh, about Helon? I'll flip to the what does it do well, but I want your take first. 
Yeah, um, it's it's a lot. It's it's your your. This is your counterpart to Yometrica. This is you you want to you want to do like all all the wind riders all the time. All of all of the new wind toys. This is this is the sub faction for you. Yeah, except for Sephiroth. Sure. I mean, we can get we. Um, we'll get into him. Yeah, I was about to say like that. That sort of. Uh, that's a discussion I think is more more applicable to like when we talk about the main characters in general. But it's it's yeah it's it really just gives you more toys for playing the stuff that you wanted to play with already. If you're all in, like uh, Christian Weir is like I I I, I want to play at least twenty of these, and here you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes for as I, you can you can all read what's on the screen, but I think this really makes for an extremely mobile force that is there yeah. to frustrate your enemy. That's going to be doing things like piling out, leaving combat completely, walking away, leaving you stranded, reducing your unit's ability to kill off turn, right? To to do damage where they don't want them to do damage, to be in the way, be blocking anything, rechaffing, like all that kind of stuff. Right is what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Now, at the same time, I should state that don't underestimate that plus one attack when you're within three inches. Okay, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, of course. Now, it's it's not the easiest thing to trigger, right? Because you got to like be in combat and then sort of stay there, right? By the time like you're shooting before you're charging normally, so it's you, you right. You're only getting it the next turn, right? But once it's firing off, if you've got like a big unit of wind riders, uh, you know they they can do significant damage. Or of course the the archers, like there there have been some gamey lists on um, floating around online where it's like, can I get a unit of twenty sentinels into combat long enough for me to do this next turn? Sure. So they get two shots per bow. I'm like, fine. Like you you've got you you've done your thing it's like smash bats it's like i i have built towards this exact thing sure and now i'm going to do it and kill something very hard with it yeah okay tom is grinning <laughs> yeah. here's here's the question i can't wait for people to be charging with ballistas to get this bonus okay so uh you really got to go all in get the five attacks out of the ballista um the here's here's my question um how do these two compare to the existing nations? Um, Tom, do you want to go first or? or... Yeah, I mean, uh, it, are, are are you still sticking with any of the original ones? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, I mean, for me, like Alumnia is like it's very like we've talked about this with sub factions before and what makes perfect sub faction. Um, it is three out of its four abilities are things that I would like write home about. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, that are sure. like really good. Um, and so it is in the conversation for me with Zaytrek and with uh, uh, CR. Yeah, I think Sire is still the king, honestly. I think it's just, I think Double Penny is the most powerful thing that's ever been put in a book ever. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, like, it just is uh, because of what you can do with it. And, but. That being said, I think I think both of the new ones compare pretty favorably. I do agree with you. I think it's up there with like Zytrek. I think it's certainly on that level um, as yeah. like the I'm just not a, a gamey, gamey, gamey power gamer, and I'd like to play something fun. Uh, so like Helon and and uh, Aluminia and uh, and Zytrek are all those right. That that's what yeah. this reads to me. It's it's like it's tier two, but it's still really good. It's called. The level that most armies would kill to have a sub faction for format. Right, right. Like, I'm, right. I'm gonna. Okay, look, you got to give me one of these in the whole show. So here's my one thing. I'm gonna say this All once, right. and then All right. I'm never gonna come back to it again. I'm not gonna say it anymore. I we, need. We one. lost Tom. That's fine. He'll be back in a second. Okay. Uh, but I need one of these. Okay. It's like here, and then like this is sire, and then. Sort of Zytrek and Aluminia, Aluminia and, and Helon and everything. And then that way down here is like everything printed in the Slanesh book. The fact that, oh, the, 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 that this book came out <laughs> right on the after Slanesh, okay, is so deeply hurtful to me. The fact that 
like Slanesh, who in my mind should have always been the army of speed kills. Every story about that army is them just <laughs> ripping around the mortal realms at lightning speed on chariots and riding these crazy mounts and just woohoo tearing around the mortal realms, smashing into people like <laughs> lunatics. Just crazy Mad Max style, you know, psychopaths screaming across the realms at ultra speed. Okay. He's not done. He's not done yet, is he? The, no, <laughs> not. The fact oh. that this book gave me gave put this speed in the hands of the elves that is like so much faster than like not even close to everything in slanesh okay it's hurtful to me and that's it i had to get it out yeah we're done that's i'm not going to mention it if i if i could laugh like rich evans and i think i I, i'm I'm thankful i cannot i would be right now sure i mean this is what i'll say just let your pain out vince uh, as as one person who just a little over a year ago experienced something very similar, I get it. Yeah, sure. I understand what you are heard. I know where you're coming from. Thank you, Chunk. All right. Uh, Anyways, there you go. Yeah. If, if can can I just before we move, we move on, I w- I would say my my opinion is at least um, it's like because when we were saying it's like there there are too many rules. What needs to get cut? I do appreciate. And like th- th- this is still the standard, I think, of the sub factions. Like, mm-hmm. CR needs to change. Like, I think CR needs pro- yeah. probably needs to be redesigned. But the play styles, the, the diversity of play styles um, available to people in each of the sub factions, which are out there, yeah, and that are also introduced within Elon. I get it. The, the Elon Musk jokes. I get it. Um, the, they're all in the chat. That's why I brought it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, good. Yeah, and Alumnia, like, they, they take the same units and just open them up for players, and I think that's just so rewarding, and that is the standard we should set. CR separately, but, like, Zytrek, Alumnia, like, people are still thinking about Yometrica because yeah. of, like, the way you can use Stone Guard and the Mountain Spirits now. Completely um, agree. Like, yeah, I, I, I agree. Other than Sire yeah. being out of bounds, I think Lumineth is actually a great example of how sub factions should be written. That's why I would have yeah. said, like, if I uh, if I was redoing this, I would just jettison all those type rules. We don't need like the Venari Sonari nonsense. Like, none of that crap needs to exist. This army I, still it could be all be perfectly on viable. You could just yes, give the appropriate units if they needed them, and not everyone did, right. by the way. Like archers don't need right. to be set up in Shining Company and have Neg One to hit built into them. They just don't. They just don't. Right. Okay. Right. Like it just it just doesn't need to be a thing that's happening. If that was just what wardens did. Right. If that was just like a warden ability. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Agreed. Right. Like whatever. So, anyways. Okay. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. I. I. I'm. I'm. Yeah. Uh, Rocco, your boy. Hey, if we find a counter for for aluminia, are we gonna call it aluminia foil? Yes. Yes, a thousand percent. That's if you both have pre-game moves. Okay, and where you have to roll off because when you both have free game moves, you have to roll off for who does it first, right? If they beat you, that's called an aluminium foil, right there. That's what the name of that maneuver is. So there you go, nailed it, nailed it. Okay, new units. Let's get. All right, now that we're on War Scrolls, I will back in twenty seconds. I am getting water. You go get some water while we start talking War Scrolls. All right, settle in, folks. Here we go. Let's get into them hot, hot new units. All right. Well, the first one's boring. Uh, so the Sonari Calligrave, this is the penman. Right. Um, Poor guy. His spell is bad. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. Like, it's just mathematically incorrect. Um, it was designed wrong. Somebody didn't check the numbers. Uh, you would never use its ability to marker light somebody because that's actually mathematically worse than just throwing a d3 wounds at them twice okay uh because you still got to cast the spell twice so it's not like it just goes Mm -hmm. off automatically or something um it doesn't work and their actual ability of the realm scribe can be very hard to use because it fires off on a bonus and it has to and it's actually a tough roll so like on round one it only goes off on a four up round two it's on a three up which is still very failable so like let me jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, for those that don't understand what Vince is saying about the mathematically 
like wrong, you are going to average more damage from two D three mortal wounds than one D six. Correct. Guy with the shoes. Always. Yes. always. It's always the right answer to throw a D three every turn than to throw that D six. Right, and D three wounds uh, against against an only hero with a twenty four inch range is overcosted on a seven. To cast. Right. That's the bottom line. Right. He's also a fragile hero, you know, five wounds on a five up save. Um, now, uh, I mean, none of that for the shrine. What's that? Yes, it does it say, does by say... the way, it actually does D3 wounds, which mm -hmm. I don't know what the heck that means. So I, I guess they still get saves against it, even. I'm not sure. Um, but even uh, yeah, so, it's a bad probably spell. would. Well, if... that's even worse. Yeah. It's like, it's very, very bad. I, there's an FAQ here of whether they meant mortal wounds and just screwed up the text. Um, well, but... if the uh, if the Daughters of Cain FAQ is anything to be to follow, then they, no, those are normal wounds, and You're that right. means that... Uh... Yeah, everybody in the chat's correct. I should have stated that I was kind of assuming that it was a misprint, but you're right. You're right. I shouldn't assume that, right? Because, I mean, like, what they did with the FAQ precedent of the Daughters of Cain is say no when it actually says wounds, it is wounds and thus... Apparently it's sure. printed as mortal wounds on the War Scroll card and in the app. There you go. So, Which again, it even more confusing. it's an <laughs> FAQ but it doesn't matter, sure. really because the spell is bad regardless. So He has a, he has a cheap body for the shrine uh, because the shrine doesn't move contrary to, to everyone in like, it's all the remember. flavor text, yeah. Right, all the flavor it, text, it, all of and the, the art. article they wrote. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it, you may not necessarily want to put your Cathalar um, or, or, or the twins like on the shrine. You may want them somewhere else on the battlefield. So having one of these, if you have them in your list, um, it is the least expensive scenario to take. Yes. Um, and uh, just having a scenario on the shrine is not a bad place to be. So like, there's, there's still value. The, the use for me to these guys, I could see the use of the, these guys in a, in a highly competitive force. I could see taking two of them, because it's only 200 points for two of them. And they're both your total Eclipse casters. You take two of them, yeah, you give them both. Dedicated. You give them both yeah. total Eclipse. You backboard them, just like you bury them somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they just literally sit in the back, and one of them tries to cast round one, the other one contemplates, and then from that point on, they both just contemplate and cast, contemplate and cast. Yeah. And it's the cheapest total eclipse engine. You have you have basic because they could sit out of dispel range, so nobody except Seraphon could even have a chance to dispel them, right? right. And you have guaranteed entire game or four fifths of the game at least total eclipse for two hundred yeah. points for two hundred points, uh, bargain, bargain deal. Right. which is way you know, cheaper than doing it as you used to with Techless. As yes. as Martin noted, um, the like all the all the the signs point to the fact that the terrain piece used to move like in the lore and in the article and stuff like that i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall <laughs> in that meeting when somebody went you know what looking at the entire book this is it right here the the shrine moves we can't have that that's way too strong Sure. With like all the rest of the layers of rules that we've talked about, <laughs> um, it's just a nightmare to try to move this big terrain piece around. That would be what the answer yeah. is. So, and um, if you were in, and if you were in combat, you would pile in as the shrine, and if you are a hurricane, you could pile in uh, six inches. Yeah, it would have been amazing. No, I'm I'm looking something up while we talk. Um, apparently, with the contemplating, I think it's printed uh, in different places that it can't be unbound. No, it can. In the base, in yeah. the book, it says it that that nine cannot be modified. In other words, you cannot yes. add other bonuses to it, which is of course right. how all of those set number things work. And then or no, penalties says, or penalties. Correct, correct. It just it fires on a nine, uh, and it but it does say but it can be unbound. Yeah, it specifically says that in the rules. Yes. Yes. All right. You just have to roll roll that hard ten. <laughs> Got to roll that hard ten, uh, or less, because your bonuses to, to unbinding still apply. But yes, again, my point is, if I was going to the only use for the Calgary, if I could really see, is you take two of them, 
you backboard them out of dispel range, and you just have them sit there and go, ba 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 ba. We hold the moon in place over the sun. Masters of the moon. Moon masters. I don't know actually what they're holding. I would assume. How do they create an eclipse? Hold on. If you're fighting in Haish, which is the sun of the mortal realms, it's what generates light. Okay, which right. I have no problem with. Like I got it. It's a bright glowing realm. It generates light for the rest of the mortal realms. I'm cool with that. Okay. So if it's the sun, okay, how do they if they're in Haish itself? Yeah, how, how the, do the they novels, total eclipse? It has a nighttime somehow. <laughs> like it's not complete darkness. It's weird, but it does have a nighttime mm-hmm. because it's technically yeah. It's, okay. it's I, uh, I don't understand. My point is it's not an eclipse. I know. An eclipse no, I, is a specific meaning. It is an it, astral right. body moving, moving there, in between there are, there are you two and the moons. source of light. There are two moons. Selenar, uh-huh. like uh, the, the Sphinx uh, body of Teclas, yep. is the avatar of the true moon of Heish, which is Selenar. Yep, with you so um, far. And then there is Leoth, which is, I believe, like the false moon. I assume that's going to be a model in Malarian's sort of shadow army. Sure. Because it's like the trickster moon or something. Sure. Um, it could just be, hey, uh, Selenar, can you, can you just like block out like all, all light for a bit? Um, and like they get on the telephone and they just call him and they say, did you, did you cast a spell? Um, I contemplated. So it just, it just happens. Sure. It's like, sure. I'll, I'll be right over. My point is um, if you're on the sun, you cannot create an eclipse. You're on the sun. <laughs> Nothing that can be between you and the light. That's so the problem. Here's where, here's where you're, you've missed that. Vince. Okay. Uh-huh. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm not asking how does it get dark. That's not what the question is. The spell is total eclipse. An eclipse is a defined thing, not nighttime. Go. Right. Now, here's where you step misstep. You see, it's a metaphor. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, got it. All right. That answers the question. Thanks, okay. Tom. Because, wait. All right. Because enlightenment has been shrouded. So the truth has been concealed. And so the heresy... Oh yeah, we're getting to the next war scroll. Here we go. All right, next war scroll. Uh Venari Bloodlust. Venari Bloodlust. Venari Bloodlust. Venari Bloodlust. Okay. As an aside, mm-hmm. I love the fact that in the lore the other moon is the trickster moon. Sure. Like yeah. insert joke about the other trickster start here. Like we'll get that eventually. Okay, giant banner man. Banner yeah. man, yep. banner man. Uh, yeah, Banner guy's cool. Uh, he's got does a he metal do weapon. anything? I'm no. glad he doesn't do what he used to do. No, he doesn't. He doesn't actually do much of anything, um, which is unfortunate. Like, like he, he reminds me of the Bannerman in the rewrite of the War Scroll of the Compendium War Scrolls. Hold on, I I'm sorry, I I reject your answer, Martin, or sorry, Marson uh, in the chat has answered it. They simply play Total Eclipse of the Heart, and that's how it happens. And when that song is playing, of course, it would take two command points to do anything because everybody is is jamming to that obvious and eternal banger. So there's no way they would heed your commands. That is the answer. Thank you. That is how Total Eclipse gets cast in Haish. Okay, I am now satisfied. At any rate, yeah, the Banner Blade doesn't do anything. That's the problem with him. He's a perfectly decent enough hero. Five wounds on a three-up save. His attack is like, okay. And... But his banner is, like, it's plus one bravery. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. again, not relevant. And hey, hey, it cancels out that penalty that you have sure. for spending your your That stone. you're never going to take because the Cathalar eats it. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and you know, what he has this once-a-game ability to fire off a, a little pulse from his banner. But the problem is, is that you get, it's, it is at the start of any phase, which is cool. Right? Like, I appreciate that. You can do it, like, in the start of the enemy charge phase or something and damage their units on the way in. Like, it's cool. But you roll a die. Like, you get to do this once, and then you roll a die for each enemy uh, unit within 18 inches of the model. If the roll is equal to or less than the number of the current battle round, then they take D3 wounds and subtract one from hit rolls. Right? So, like, on turn three, 
you've got a 50 50 shot of it affecting the units with an 18 inch spin so you're saying it's a bad knight azuros lantern yeah 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 that's exactly what i'm saying yes and so like i mean it's bigger range but it's much less effect right i i do have one i have like the find the world's smallest tinfoil hat because i have a i have a tiny tinfoil hat theory um, most of the offenders of what made 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy as unfun as were, could were be. Were army battle standard bearers that gave broken abilities to units? Specifically the most broken, the silly one. Like, cause it's like when, when, when Beast of Nurgle came out and like the Beast of Nurgle War Scroll, I mean, like I, I, I understand Broken Realms has changed it a little bit, but like when they made the new plastic Beast of Nurgle, which was one of the main things that people just like went on about as just like oppressive. And is now terrible. Uh, Banner of the World Dragon. Sure. And everyone yeah. would start to shake in their boots when they saw that it was called, I believe it's called the World Banner. Yeah. And just what it did. And I'm kind of glad that this that this is not doing what the Banner of the World Dragon used to do. Because sure. this army does enough already. You mean that it's just not ever going to be taken? Got it. Yeah, I mean, he's he's yeah. a nice, cool dude. It's a beautiful model. But like he doesn't. The actual main problem to me isn't even like the 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 swinginess of the banner firing off, where you could easily fire it off and just get nothing out of it. Like mm-hmm. you're you're talking if you use it later than turn three, it's too late. The game's over, right? Yeah. But like I'm um, just to, I'm sorry. Just just one thing in the chat, just to be real quick about it. Banner of the World Dragon was this thing that High Elves could take. Um, it had a like two paragraphs of epic flavor text. And then just broke about five or six rules with two sentences of rules. Yeah, I mean, most importantly, um, it gave you a two of ward save against demons. Yes, an entire faction, one unit, got a two, uh, 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 basically immune to damage from one faction of the game. It yeah. was it was super fun uh, as a player of demon was, armies during yeah, that time period. It was, was a, it great. It was an it was amazing against as a high elf player. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, anyways. Yeah, I did love massive Silver Helm charges full of those. That was great. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, um, like the, the real problem to me with this unit is actually it's a pretty expensive army, and this guy actually doesn't have a real defined role. Right. Right. And so, like, the banner could have actually had an interesting role to supplement some units. I'm actually kind of glad it doesn't, because I think there's too much synergy in this book. But it doesn't, and so because of the nature of the thing... It's funny... You remember when they took... Have you went into Legends and read all of the old banners? Like, you know, it's all the old army BSBs, you yeah. know, where there was, like, dedicated models, and they legended all of them, right? Yep. yep. Do you remember what all those do now? I remembered what they did before when they were good, and then I also remember what they did when they changed them to be worthless for their points as a compendium scroll, I don't know what they did when they rewrote them as legends that we've never heard about since. They all have a mortal wounds pop on them. That's what they, they all really? do. Yeah. They're this. Huh. They're this rule. All of them <laughs> are just like, they're just like, pop a thing and, and do mortal wounds. Roll a dice, maybe bubble. something cool happens. Yeah. They're all hey, like that. Hey. So they literally just imported those legends rules. This is a little bit stronger and a little bit more, like it's more wounds because most of those are just like a single mortal wound to about the same area but they don't have the turn counter on it you just like do it yeah so yeah it's pretty funny uh yes he is gonna look awesome on a display board though like if you've got a display board you don't have this guy on the top of like a castle what are you doing with your life come on now yeah okay true. uh cool uh the venari lord regent the lord uh maybe the most beautiful model in the range maybe could be. Been waiting 10 years for a model like this. So gorgeous. Solid hero. He frees up spells for your army. So let's break this dude down real quick. He has a his purest Aether Quartz ability, which as long as he has Aether Quartz of any kind, uh, he gets Neg 1 to be hit. Uh, and he has plus 1 to cast for his spell, which is Greater Power of Aish, which is a really good spell. His uh, Regent Sword is a Sun Metal weapon, and so does Sun Metal stuff, and so can benefit from Power of Heish and Greater Power of Heish or whatever. Well, he has the rule, which is what matters. Yes, he Not has the rule. Not everybody has that. Correct. We'll talk about that in a minute. And yes, he is a wizard. He can do one spell, uh, and which is, as I said, with you know a single cast. 
uh, with plus one to cast. And he is greater power of Heish. is basically the same as power of Heish, which is the your mortal wounds on sixes for sun metal weapons now trigger on fives. Um, however, he can do it to D3 units, uh, which is fantastic uh, because it means that... Hey, okay. Uh, come here. They've been... Con yeah. Uh, Inspiring anyway, in the chat, the dog no, attack. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, it, so he can free up your other units to cast, right? That's the key. Like if you it's drop so spells or fail to cast, he can he can cover them on the backside, or you can do him right. first, cover multiple units, and then those units can be freed up to do other spells. Um, yeah, it's so funny you, you said that. I would do it the other like I would do it the way where he's the backup sure. that covers units that that miss their spell. Yeah. Um, you get to build. Seems like a gamble, otherwise. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like he is a really good mobile defensive character. Um, he's 150 points. There's absolutely no reason I would want to find that deeply offensive. Uh, but you know, yeah, he's um. Here, you can. Yeah. Here. Um. Well, well, what I was about to say while we're doing the dog attack. Up, dog attack. There we go. Okay, go ahead, Martin. Um, oh, the only thing better than doggos would be a cat butt sneaking into Martin's screen. Uh, we are not a cat family. Uh, my Corky is sleeping on a rug out of view. I'm not going to wake her up. Um, now, this this is a, a perfect vehicle for CR's goading arrogance. Yep. Um, it's first of all um, one of our um, and Tom and I have talked about this many times. One of the scenarios which hurts Lumina the most was uh, places of arcane power because we yep. did not have fast heroes. And now right. what do we have? A 14-inch uh, 3-plus save. I get it. CR could be 1-plus save if you really wanted. Absolutely. Uh, uh, casting character um, who can take magic items and just, just be fun, fast, and just get there right away, have troops yep. to back them up. And, yeah, um, go goading arrogance in particular, just... just I, I know CR was not in the new stuff that we covered, but it's like that. Um, you will see this often as a CR general. Yeah, I think this guy's mm -hmm. great. He, he really is. By the way, if you like the dog and think it's cute, hit like. Uh, so there you go. Otherwise, you'll make the uh, yes. Otherwise, you'll make the dog sad. You don't want to make the dog sad. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, and what does the dog think of the Venari Lord Regent? What do you think of it? Woof. She likes it. I can tell. Uh, yeah, this guy's fantastic. Like what a wonderful hero! Six wounds is actually great. Like it's it sounds silly. Like I, I'm surprised he wasn't seven wounds, but the fact that he's out yeah. of catapult range is what's important. He can't get like one catapult. Uh, bop will oh, take uh, him down. Yeah, I hope this heralds a change for Stormcast because I'm yeah. tired of Stormcast. Like sp like immortal. Like it's basically the effective like space marine heroes yeah. having only five wounds. Like I would like to hope I would like to see them all get a wounds bump. Yep. When when they rewrite that Stormcast book again, like if this is a, this is an elf on a giant sort of llama cougar, um, I know it's called a light courser steed, but it's still like a large, like mount, yeah. and it's only six wounds. Lord Sal Salaston, you got to pump those numbers up. Yep. Oh, I see. Somebody specifically hit dislike just for the dog. That's very mean. That's a very mean. Aww. That's gonna make the dog sad, very sad. Sad doggo. Yep. Yeah. The, the dog is sad about your dislike. Uh, anyways, yeah, I think this guy's awesome. Uh, I mean, he... Uh, I think he'll show up, I agree with you, in a lot of sire lists. I think that's where he's super strong. But he's super strong in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's so mobile, can be super defensive, is covering for your other units at the same time mm -hmm. with his spell, mm -hmm. right? It's good. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, solid value. I think... I think we should do a sidebar and do a side-by-side -side comparison with the 150-point Slanesh hero. Uh... <laughs> Which one? Okay, so, um, all right. Elenia and Elithor, the twins. Possibly one of my favorite War Scrolls in the book. Yeah, super cool War Scroll, no doubt. Uh, Eight-wound hero I... with a three-up save and a six-inch move. It can be allied into anything. Uh, any, sorry, any order army, any order, uh, so which is neat, uh, and can give them bon can give bonus command points if they're hanging out near your general, which I'm not sure they will be very often, but still they could. Um, the 
uh, Altari or Altitiri or whatever his sword is, uh, has uh, this interesting damage mechanic that is set to the turn. Same with the... So there's a lot of things in the Lumineth book that are set to the turn number for just, like, no yeah. reason. I don't, I don't know why the Lumineth care about the progression of the turn order, but uh, okay. Unreliability and uh, complexity. That's why. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. Like, it just feels unnecessary. Like, this guy could have just had a two damage weapon or something, and it would have been fine. Um, but, sure, so his damage goes one, two, three, four, five. That being said, it's like you're not going to get that four and five barely ever because games don't really go to turn four or to turn four and five very often. Uh, but if you get into four and five, things can get messy real quick. Yes. Uh, it is a two cast wizard, uh, which two cast scenario to cast. Scenario. Yeah. Yes, absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it is a very interesting ally. It does have this really complicated teleport mechanic and it's sudden translocation that I really don't love. Uh, just the way it works, like, because the way it's structured is at the end of the combat phase, roll a die if this model fought in that phase. Okay? So, not a may, must. Right? Right. And if the roll is less than the number of the current battle round, so again, like, the third trigger of current battle round on this, this guy, but it is less yeah. than, not less than, yeah. or equal to. Okay? Uh, less than the current battle round, or less than the number of wounds allocated to this model, okay, then heal D6 wounds, then remove it from the battlefield, then set up the model anywhere on the battlefield more than 12 inches away from enemy models. If it's impossible, they just leave, but don't count as being slain. What in all so. that is holy? It is a forced heal teleport. Like, it can force you to literally pull them out of combat, right? They could be yeah. in combat, you fought, it's like turn three, you roll the die, maybe they took no wounds. Maybe they're unwounded right, right. now, right? So you roll one or two, and they're you roll like... roll one beat. or two, you have to pull them out of that combat and go teleport them somewhere else on the board 12 inches away from enemies. Could be real good. Maybe there's an open objective. It's fantastic. Could be real bad. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. No, no, so I was saying, it's like, I, I do actually, I actually like this rule. Like, I get it, it's unreliable. Like, that, that it's it's not quite competitive, like, but that that's not the point. So, like, reading their story and everything, or it's like, so so the sword and, and just, like, the brother can get carried away. Like, he's he's getting too crazy in combat. And she pulls and him this, out, yeah. Right, but the sister's supposed to be, like, the calm, collected one. But she also saves him in a way that is equally as impetuous as the brother sure. and i and i like that um uh but that, yeah i just like as comp like first of all the, this thing is just worded weirdly right like and it almost guarantees that if you fight at all in the late game you're going to get bailed out yeah and i don't necessarily like that um like you could still have the teleport if like if, if in another way but it's it's turn five like if you fight you're getting you're almost guaranteed what what i don't like about it is that you can't hold objectives with this unit right sure because if somebody's gonna just like charge you fight you and then there's a high probability chance you're just like okay bye <laughs> right right yeah right but at the same time if you get into a unit or if you're on objective late game and somebody gets into you they may not walk away from that. Yeah, sure, because you're swinging around like a four damage sword. Sorry, right. my corgi wanted permission to go upstairs for some reason. You're yes. fine. All good. Yeah, and and not just like an insignificant one, like a four attack, four damage sword. Yeah, sure. Like they bring ten, they t they bring ten models in on you. That may not be enough for them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a it's it's a very interesting piece. I I legitimately don't know how to rate this thing competitively. I think it's super cool. Like flavor wise, this is one of the coolest sort yeah. of units they've ever made. And I think this would be a really interesting model to play, right? Uh, like it's going to so, do weird things that are very surprising to your opponent. So this is what I would like. So I'll just open this way. I like them. I like the stock. Right? Like, I like the unit. I'm in. And in general, I would try to include this unit in every army that I build just because I like what's 
going on. I like having this weird late game powerhouse because that's what it is. Sure. Like this is this is the unit that I stick with a, a unit of ten sword masters, and I push up on an objective, and I say, "I dare you to come in," right? Um, and we'll talk about sword masters here in a minute. But I think that like alone, I think these twins are a liability. But you stick them with a unit of sword masters, and I think there's real gas in the engine. I can see that. Yeah, because because the sword masters actually complement and shore up the weakness of the twins in every way possible. Like in both attack profiles in, in, in all of those things. Sure. Um, so, so, um, a few things, and it was pointed out to me that apparently, um, elves, uh, of, of many, of many, sh uh, shapes and sizes, like using the turn number, uh, like doc and IDK use the turn number and some sure. of their mechanics. I think, um, Lumina triple down on it. Like okay, we're, sure. we're seeing multiple war scrolls, just like, require the turn number to be a part of what they do. Maybe that's a bit too much. Um, and is this the part where we can, we can talk about um, my, my gripes about keyword locked certain things for sub factions, or do we want to wait for another named character about that? Uh, well, we covered the, I, I don't yeah. have the actual named yeah. Lord Regent. We just passed him. So yeah, it's a fine time to, yeah. to talk about yeah. it. We should I, talk about I, the I, fact that all of the named yeah. characters are keyword yeah. locked. So, so we're, we're running into this thing now, and I think it's more acutely felt in Lumineth than other armies, excluding maybe Stormcast, but maybe um, with Gardas on the horizon, we may be seeing an end to that. But there's just certain things where I feel like they should just add a rule saying that this unit cannot gain sub-faction keywords, because there are things in Lumineth like Teclas, the Light of Altharian, who can gain any faction keyword. Um, but there's certain, like Severith, like is um, Right. Yeah, the 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 ward we specifically have the warden of Yometrica, and yet cannot benefit from any of the sub faction rules that Yometrica offers. Sure, and it's it just it feels strange, like we we have this sort of um, uh, exaltation of the symmetry of the eight na great nations that um, presumably will become those sub factions, like the other two. Um, and it's like, wh why are these Yometrica? Like, instead of having a rule saying they can't gain. It, 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 you, you get where I'm, you get where I'm do, going totally. with that? It yeah. was a weird choice yeah. to, like, it feels like this decision to corral the power of the unique characters away from the sub-factions by locking them all to the one sub-faction they could gain nothing from, rules-wise. Yeah, and it's not just with Lumineth. Like we see, with every Underworlds War band gains the fa if if that army has sub factions, they are locked to. Like we haven't seen the War Scroll yet for uh, the OBR War band, but I would put money down saying that they're Mortis Praetorians and so on and so forth. Sure. Um, the right. weird part yeah. about this book is that it's locking. Like <clears throat> that's fine. Sometimes those right. things get locked into sub factions where it's like, okay, they can still play. They still like can benefit. Hagnar, Hagnar, yeah. Uh, yeah, Morgoth yeah. being locked into Hagnar is not a bad thing, right? Like, I mean, right. it's a thing. It's definitely not a bad thing. It's just a right. thing. Whereas, like, in this book, it's weird that all of the characters, regardless of, like, whether they seem to be more Huracanon type characters or, or whether they are Alarith sort of stone people or whatever, right? that they're all hard locked to Yometrica, to literally a sub faction and to a set of rules that they can that they just gain nothing from. Right. right? Now yep. we should state they still keep their other type rules. Like as has been pointed out, Elania and Elithor still have are still Sonari. So they can still contemplate Right, yep. and we'll, they can be after eclipse rotation. Right, absolutely. Later on, we'll talk when we talk about um, the uh, the Severith about Severith, right? The Spirit of the Wind. He still has Huracanon, right? It's just you can't put him in Illumnia or Helos, or, sorry, Helon, and like he can't ever get the bonus attack for being in combat or anything like that because he's always stuck to Yometrica, a sub faction that again just does nothing for him. Right? Yeah. Right. Now it's it's um, and someone said, oh, this might be a sign of third edition. No, they've done this. Like it's they've done this since I think Gardas, 
Um, excluding characters which aren't sub-faction, like, like Teclas and the Light of Altharian don't have faction keywords. I'm oh, sorry, sub-faction keywords. But like Gardas, I think, is the first one. The first and non-Hammers a, of Sigmar special character. In he's, the first special, he's the first special character, I think, in Age of Sigmar to have a sub-faction keyword, which is not the box art sub-faction. Right. If they have a sub-faction keyword at all. That's incredible. Yeah, it's it's crazy how much we've been hard locked to single to the sort of banner yeah. banner faction, as it were. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and can I just say one more thing? Since we skipped Lirior, and sure. like I, I yeah, 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 we didn't talk um, about Lirior. He's the yeah. named Lord Regent. He's two hundred ten yeah. points. He's. Um, I am. I am just tired of the one attack weapons. Um, I, I think we need to break from the verisimilitude idea that, that one dice roll for an attack equals one swing of a weapon. Like, I think, because that's what I think people hooked up on, on like, on Gargits. I think it's okay for, like, something like that, and, and stop me if I'm wrong after this, Vince, because I'm talking about Gargants, um, to swing X times at lower damage than to do one Godzilla-sized dice roll that still equates to zero half the time. Yeah, it's it's an extra thing on there. He's not really meant to be an offensive piece, but sure. I, I get what you're saying. It's completely. Right. It's weird yeah. to see the one lance attack when like everything else isn't structured like that. So sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's keep moving. All right. Sonari Lore Seeker. Uh <laughs> Best hero in the history of AOS. I have that written here. Uh let me mm -hmm. check my notes. Uh, yes, that is correct. This is the best hero uh, that has ever been created in, in the history quick? of the game. Sure. Can I jump? I, like, we moved by, by this quickly, and I, I want to call this out. Um, yes, they have the Sonari keyword, Alania and Elathor. Uh -huh. They also have the Venari keyword. They're the only unit in the yeah, book that has both. both keywords. Sure, that's fine. And so from a keyword suit standpoint, from of triggering abilities, from Swordmaster guarding... All like they trigger all the everything, the command yeah. abilities, the everything. Wonderful. And Can so, we talk about this ridiculous guy now? This is the th I've been. Yes. I've been yeah, this. that's fine. He's really good. Again, best hero in the history of AOS. Yes. This is a six wound hero with a six inch move and a four up save. He has a decently fine ranged attack in his staff for no reason that makes two attacks on threes and threes neg two d3 damage and a perfectly good sword attack with fours on twos threes neg one d3 damage he's fine in combat but that is not why you take him okay uh he has this ability to gain a command point if our enemies with artifacts of power get killed near him who cares whatever that those that should have been struck that rule should not be there it doesn't need to be there it's silly that it's there He's a caster with no spell. That is to say, like, he can just use Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield and his Sonari spell, obviously. But he doesn't have a War Scroll spell. Who cares? Like like Eclipse? Sure, sure. Like Eclipse, yes. for example. He can um, be in your rotation as well. Uh, and uh, this guy... Now let's talk about the only thing on this scroll that matters. This, this guy. This guy. Lone Agent. You can add one to save rolls for attacks that target the model this this model if it's more than nine inches away from enemy friendly or from friendly models. So he goes to a three up save if there's no other friendlies around. Okay, it's fine. Okay. In addition, that's the, that is the <laughs> biggest in addition in this book. Instead of setting up this model on the battlefield, you can place it to one side and say that it is set up as a lone agent in reser a reserve unit. If you do so, at the start of the first battle round, before determining who has the first turn, you must set up this model on the battlefield anywhere that is more than three inches away. Three inches away. That's it. From any enemy units. And not in your territory. Not in your territory. If you set up this model within six inches of an objective that has no enemy units within six inches of it, you gain control of the objective and your opponent cannot gain control of it while this model is within six inches of it. Holy crap. Oh, you have giants that count for as 45 models? I don't care. Cool, cool story, bro. Yeah, I, I own this. I own yeah. this. This is mine now. Look at me. Look at me. I am the captain. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, there are... Like, this dude 
can win games almost on his own. Now let's talk about some things. I got a little bit. I'm going to fly through this now. I want you guys just take on it. On the in the back of the book, he is marked as unique. Okay, so you can only have one of yeah. them. Now there is no tangible reason why this guy is unique. Okay, by tangible reason, I mean it doesn't say this guy is a named character. That's what it says on everybody else who's named. Let's look back at here. Elania and Elithor. Elania and Elithor are named characters that are a single model. Okay? All named characters say that. All of them. Okay? He does not. Uh, so, is he supposed to be yeah. unique? I would argue, no. There's nothing uh, unique about him. Okay? Yeah, there is so... nothing unique about him. However, they realized that allowing you to take very late in the process, probably, uh, John Byer, they can use the their rules instead of the scenario rules, and I don't want to get into that for Gargans because that itself is a total nightmare. But he's not using the scenario rules. He's saying, I'm within six inches of an objective, so I own this now. Period. Yeah, he's, You're within he's, six he's, inches he's of saying... an objective where no one else is. When he, when he right. sets up, that's the yeah. trigger. Okay, right. he did that. He already stapled over the scenario rules. Those are no longer in play. So the Giants can overwrite the scenario rules all day long. He's like, ha ha, too bad. We're not using those rules. I He's like, I already overwrite those. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, so, the key is that he ignores whatever claim rules are anyways. Right. My, so let's, let's imagine we were in a scenario that could only ever be capped by battle line. Let's say that that existed. He'd say, no, this is my objective now. Correct. Correct. He can already overwrite the normal rules because the way this is written, he can do like, this can only be taken by X. No, it can't if it can be taken by me. Uh, notably, right, um, on something like Places of Arcane Power where you normally have a three-inch claim zone, mm -hmm. he can just set up six inches away and take it. That's what my rules say, yo. I don't need to be within three inches to take your stupid thing. I'll take it at six inches. Deal with that. Okay. So it it is peak Warhammer that so so like because this is the thing of the FAQ. In the general's handbook, it says what name. Um, I'm sorry. It says what unique means. Um, and in the core rules, it says what named character means. Right. But in the description of pitched battle profiles, which took like the longest things for people to read, it says these are now the same thing. Yeah, where so they you're are talking like separate. over top of your war scroll points where it says yeah. this thing, right? And and right. so can this guy get a magic item or take a command trait? I don't know. I probably not. Maybe no. yes. I don't know. Like my point is he's not named specifically unless that text at the top of the points thing ties them together. Because it says all unique characters are named characters. And it effectively forced right. those together. But right. this guy doesn't have the statement that says he is a named character. No, it, but it says that he's unique in the chart. And if it says he's unique in the chart, that means he is named. Right. I Again. think they just pulled this level a lever. Instead of saying, instead of writing out the text, you can only include one lore seeker in your army. They just say, they just thought writing unique would do that for them. That's that my is point. the. I think this right. occurred so late in the process because they realized having multiples of these guys in your army would just like you could it would become unbeatable. Like if you could take multiples of these guys, if that unique was a mistake, let's say the FAQ. Let's imagine a world. Come with me on a journey, okay? <laughs> let's just imagine a world where they go. Uh, Oops, all berries, that shouldn't have said unique. You know, we accidentally misprinted it in the chart. No, you can take multiple lore seekers, knock yourself out. Of course he's not unique, right? It's not a unique guy. Like, yeah, you can they, they you can have multiples of them, okay? Let's just imagine that happened. I'm not saying I think that's what'll happen. I'm saying, like, let's just say that happens. Dear God, fear this guy. If you don't have two of these in your list, what are you doing with your life? No. You, there are so many scenarios, you'll just win at setup. It would just be instantly gross. So I pray to God they don't do that. Now, Because you know what you do? Is you do alumnia that can um, pre-game right. move. Yes. And you move your sword masters up on them or teleport them with Teclas. 
or double or, move or, spell or, them or or or, or. yeah of course. and then yeah. and then and bu- bunker them with shrine of amniac with etc cetera, etc cetera, and they'll never yeah, that, that 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 silliness that was going around last week where it's like no never. one will do this uh where it's like you can do uh bill and vortex and sanctum of amim talk um and penny and 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 i mean right. no one will do that but it's the fact yeah. that it's possible is just yeah i will <laughs> sure yeah putting them on a yeah. bail and then surrounding them by the shrine then being in sire and double pennying so you can have like yeah. plus five to your save so you're technically on like a, a neg two save yeah sure yeah uh, and technically uh you could potentially also uh you couldn't set up on it but if you were in your own territory you could be on your shrine and be at neg one because you're garrisoning and get an additional plus one to save yeah all of the, the well documented are the ways that you can put this guy on an objective and never lose that objective. Yeah, sure. Right. There are there are ways to protect him. Yes, he's only a six wound hero. Yes, of course he's removable. He's not immortal. He's not even close. But, There's plenty but of ways on. to kill him. He's not. He is not a six wound hero. Stop. If you've got blade masters near him, I understand. I know he. They can if you have blade masters, he's a twelve wound hero. I understand. Or anybody, more, depending anybody, on how many sword masters you've got around. Well, no. 50-50. On average, 50-50, they're going to take half of his wounds. And so, on average, he's going to go to 12 wounds. Sure. Now, again, uh, here's what I will say about that, about all of that, right? Um, the the trick with this game, the, the, the yes, this dude is removable. And certainly there are some armies that aren't afraid of this at all. Because, like, they just happen to have the right, like, ranged power projection that they can go, I see what you're doing there, no. And they can, like, burn this guy down at such a range to just get rid of him early, right? Okay, fine, right? But but that isn't a huge number of armies, honestly, okay? They can just, like, dump mortal wounds into him very early or hit him with enough high rend that he can't, like, penny his way out of it or whatever, right? Um, the trick with it is this game is often won by like holding an objective for one turn longer than you should have. Right. Um, and there are places where it's like, can I keep the question you should ask yourself is, is there a way I can keep this guy alive until turn three? Right. Where it doesn't matter what bodies are on the objective with me. Can I bubble wrap him? or whatever, right, where I can just keep him alive until turn three. In most scenarios, if he's holding his objective till turn three, and then you've got other things off doing the rest of the work, it's a huge step towards victory. Right? Mm-hmm. So, my, uh, so my point is, is that, uh, that, like, first of all, I hope they keep the unique, and I hope you can only take one. Okay. Um, the we just want to give him magic. I don't items understand to what Man Dolly's is, is answering there. Page three of pitch battle GHB can only be included one. Yeah, of course we know that. I don't. I don't know what you're answering there, Man Dolly's. You'll have to tell me. Like nobody, nobody was arguing you can take more of these guys. I was saying, imagine a world where you could, right? Like where they, where they, where they say unique was printed in error because he doesn't have named or anything written on him. No, pe- people want to give it magic items because it's like. Yes, I think you'd like it would be neat to give him magic items or whatever. Sure, that would be fun. Right? Cuz he's not it would but that op- like my point is it's going to open up a new space cuz this would be the first unique non-named character, right? That we have in the game. And and the reason uh that he's like that is theoretically because again, I argue they they realized he was too powerful and they needed to cap him and we don't have a way to write 0 to 1. Right? Other than saying unique. That's it. Right? We don't have, like, a little entry like we used to have in our old Warhammer Fantasy books that said how many of the unit you were allowed to take. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now that I, I don't have any other comments about this guy, I really like it. The Celestine a... Prime is a unique named character. I've seen multiple people say this. Go read his War Scroll. I literally shared it on Twitter today. The Celestine Prime is a named character. It says it right there. His name is is the Celestant Prime. That is his name. The Lion of Sigmar. Okay, anyways. Get out of here with that. 
No. And the Cambay and, Tumbo, that crap. I already already been there. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. No, so, so people say it's a lore seeker, not keeper. No. This is this is the the apology for the original lore master of Hoeth. And maybe they overdid it, but apology accepted. <laughs> I love like I love everything about like when I first wrote lists i was like i want all the lore seekers and all the blade lords and i just want all of that and i was you know and obviously better judgment won over and i diversified my lists and stuff like that but like if i could just go with all that i probably would do that i just love it mm -hmm. i love all the toys and all the fun stuff and the spells and the fighting and the magic and yep yeah so yeah. at any rate this guy's real interesting. Like, he's a fantastic tech piece. And at only 160 points, that's why. It's not that there aren't more powerful heroes or stuff like that. Like, the tech on this guy is crazy. Yeah. Right? For what he allows. And, like, there will be W's you will put on the board simply by this guy existing. Regardless because of whether or not he's allowed to take magic items. You know, even if he stays completely unique. Even if he, they, they rule that, like, the pitch battle profile statement... It occurs over top of the points. It says unique things count as named and blah, 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 whatever. Like, they, you will still put some W's up on the board solely because you've got this one guy in your list. Because he will hold a point. He will be Blade Lord guarded. You'll bubble wrap him and it won't matter. You know, because they just your opponent will not be able to take the objective off of you. Uh, I was corrected Period. in the comment, by the way. Um, it's Blade only Lord's. It's yeah. on a two plus, plus not on a five, four plus. So, uh, twelve is not the right answer. It's like, uh, you know, a lot, lot, lot more depending on how many wounds of sword masters you have. Yeah, it's just it's a lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's again. I I stand behind my statement. He is the best hero in the history of AOS. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, good stuff. Great tech piece. Uh, please stay unique. <laughs> please don't break the game and fix that. <laughs> fix that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we go. The Wind Mage. Woo! The little Wind Mage. Uh, he's real fast. Uh, you know, 60-inch move, 5-up save. He gets a little better against shooting. He can, like, knock arrows back at people, which is funny, and cause mortal wounds. He makes uh, when he makes wind chargers uh, go faster if they start near him, uh, real near him, uh, like super near him, which is cool. And uh, he's a wizard. He actually has a pretty interesting spell. Uh, his spell is kind of cool. This is the first spell I've seen written like this. There might be another one that exists somewhere, but I don't remember any of the spells structured exactly like this. So maybe that maybe the chat will know. Um, but like the way his spell works is. It has a casting value of 5. If successfully cast, in your next shooting phase, you can pick an enemy unit within 9 of the caster and roll a die. On a 2-up, they take D3 mortal wounds. That's interesting. Because that allows him to like cast it somewhere, zip forward 16 inches, and then hit the dude he wants to hit with it. Like He doesn't have to be in range in the hero phase. Yeah, right? but it's 9 inches. No, I understand. It's, it's a danger-close spell. Uh, but, I mean, it doesn't matter for reasons we'll talk about later. In the combat phase, when he's not engaged, he's going to go six inches backwards. But, like, he's... Like, I, I think it's a bad spell. I think... I think I think patently it's a bad spell because it still has to double-check to see if it'll fire off at D3. Yeah, at two close plus. range. Yes. It's a two-plus at close range, at nine inches range. Like, I just... Yeah. This guy's a five-up save hard pass uh, uh i think this guy goes to shows up in a ton of lists <clears throat> because of what he enables reasons i'll talk about in a minute like i yeah. agree i agree like i he was like him with a set of wind chargers is in one of my lists so i i think that like i i don't think he's terrible i don't think he, I, I think that he shows up in lists but i think that his we i think the weaknesses that he has inherently make him very unappealing to me uh let me i want to answer a question because this is an yeah. interesting conversation. This is going around. So, so John Byard said, would anyone be seriously upset if models that were unique weren't allowed in competitive play? Yes, absolutely. I would be furious. Furious beyond reason. As would, like, a lot of people. Because in your head, you're thinking of, of, you're thinking of stuff, but, like, I'm thinking of the mask. 
half of my heroes in Slanesh are unique. The yep. Mask, Silesque. Like, no, I bought those things because I want to play with my toys. We're not just, we're, they're yeah. not all Archeon and stuff like that. The Mask is a perfectly reasonable, unique named character. And they're cool and they have flavor and character. I want these characters in the world and I want to pilot them. It's neat to pilot a named character. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be allowed in competitive play, why we shouldn't be able to find a home and balance them. That's just, that's a complete overswing. Like, I'm not trying to call you out, John. I'm just like, th no. there's there's a there's a ton of interesting named unique characters in the game that aren't like game breaking, many of which are never taken. Most of them are honestly competitively bad. Right? Yeah. Like Light of Altharian comes to mind. Like, there's only a few that actually are even worth putting on the table in competitive play. And yeah, no, so in it's... a tournament, I want to be able to take the mask. The mask has been it is the single best unit in Sladesh. Period. Yeah. And it's not because it's overpowering, it's because it offers unique things. Right. It's that the, the other the unit only freaking unit bring. I have that's reasonably priced for what it does. Right. Okay. So it's funny. It's funny that you bring this up because, um, like, there's an event that we regularly attend where you can't take unique characters, right? Um, and actually, like, it forced me to take a double take with my Lumineth because over most of my heroes that I take in my Lumineth armies that I've built, like on my, on my list building, are named heroes. That's not true anymore. And that's, I, that's not that's not a true fact of that that event you're talking about. Well, it was at least at one point. Yeah, years um, ago. But that's, that's, that's raw. That's not holy events, and raw is very different. Like holy events used to to not have um, named characters, and yeah, that was like, like that years ago, four years ago. Yeah, uh, it's true. I'm just acknowledging that those events do exist. They have yeah. existed, and and but the reality is, is it's it's difficult if that is the rule. Because it changes the entire way that many armies play, one hundred percent. Yeah, sure. And like, and so, like, I may have a perfectly viable army competitively if I have a name character. If it is not a name character, it is not a uh, character. I it is not an army I can take to an event. Yeah, sure. So, anyways, that's so. At any rate, we, we got to be distracted there. But let's go back to to the wind mage. He's cool. One hundred twenty point wizard. He's fine. Super fast. I like his speed. Um, like I'm down with him. He's cool. I like what he enables. I think he's yeah. fine. Allows you to um, take the wind lore. If you're not if you're not taking techless, you have yeah. you have your gateway to the wind lore here. Yeah, he, he's he's one of your, he's your teleport enabler, right? Because that's yep. where the the new teleport spell is in that lore. Um, or like, techless. Or techless, sure, of course. But I, I think a lot you, of times, yeah, if you don't go ahead, go ahead, Martin. No, I'm saying it's like if you're not taking techless, this is your right. gateway into the wind lore for your army. Yeah. True. Yeah, and I, I, my honest answer is, I think this dude will show up in a lot of lists, not because of what's printed on this scroll, but because mm -hmm. of the the tools, the tech he's enabling, enabling the teleport, enabling the wind, the wind chargers to go faster, right? It, like he's just doing a lot of other stuff that isn't written on that scroll. And like, yeah, sure, he's five wounds on a five up save, but in that army, if you're shooting at this dum dum, after turn one or two, like, okay, <laughs> like. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's fine. Uh, and uh, to, so John's point is: should a model ever be so powerful that its inclusion warps the power level of a faction and allows it to play in a competitive space? It's a great discussion. I think that's honestly a whole show. Like, well, what should be the yeah. power level of unique characters? That's a great show. Well, can I can I jump in? I want to flip that question. I, I, we don't have to engage it, but I want to ask instead the question of: should unique abilities ever be exclusively available on named characters that aren't on other units? Sure. A great thing to talk about in that show. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, like there's, there really is this, this, that, that the interesting thing that the lore seeker triggered there could be like a, a whole show in and of itself because the presence yeah. of named characters and how prolific they are does raise interesting questions about how they get used. Okay. Yep. Oh, we're here at last. We're here there at we last go. boys. Tuck in. Severeth. Lord of the seventh wind. The fox spirit in every furry's uh, moment of celebration that they have representation in this game. So, uh, that's not said with judgment. You live your life. Okay? You do you. Uh, so, uh, the unique one 
is a hero. The non-unique one is not a hero. Very important to understand. I'm gonna. I only have Severus scroll up because we can just talk about. Yeah. We can. You can just subtract two abilities from him and get the non-name. Yeah. One. He is the most mobile unit in the history of Age of Sigmar, maybe ever. Martin, I'm gonna tell you a story. All Why? right. Martin, this I used to. Story. Martin, I. You know, back in the day, I used to play 40k. Did you know that? Um, vaguely, but sure. yeah. Long time ago, I used to play 40k. I played during third edition. I had Imperial Guard army, and you know sure. what I loved in Imperial Guard, Martin? Um, I'm gonna say Rough Riders. Uh, you're not wrong, but also tanks. I love <laughs> tanks. Tanks are cool, right? Like, who doesn't want to sure. play tanks? Tanks are sweet. They have big, giant cannons on them, right? Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite tanks was the Basilisk. And the Basilisk yes. had the super long gun. Like, it was the World War One looking long gun, right? Yeah. Kind of looked like a World War One type tank. Same kit. So around today. I'm sure it is. Probably the same thing. No, it is. Heard. It is. Cool. It's a great kit. I, I love that tank. I might go buy one and paint one sometime just for fun. Anyways. It, uh, that gun had a range of 120 inches. 10 feet, Martin. 10 feet. Yes. 10. It is, it is only surpassed by the Death Strike, which I believe has a range of 96 feet. There you go. It didn't, didn't exist when I was there. 10 uh -huh. feet. 10. 10 feet, man. And I used to think, what a funny thing that is. That's hilarious. I can shoot tables at the tournament next to me. I can just start mm -hmm. artillery shelling adjacent tables. Right? Yeah. And effectively, the range was just unlimited. And I love that the normal fox, so the normal fox spirit, not Severeth, his maximum move, if you put everything into him, he can move 121 inches. That's right. Yeah. He can outpace <laughs> the basilisk. He can go from bell to bell. To, like He can go... Across the table, back and into the midboard before he stops in a single round, right? How wonderful! Uh, so there you go. Uh, I now that's obviously an insane thing. It's never really going to be that, but I thought that was a fun little yeah. factoid. Uh, there you go. Uh, people, people are asking you the death strike. The death strike missile is a meme. It's apocalypse only, I believe. Um, I, or you can use it in 40k now. You use it to shoot someone's figure case in the parking lot. Sure, of course. Yeah. Anyways, let's talk about Severeth himself. Yeah, 24 inch move, five up save, ten wounds. The uh, non named version, the non hero version, has eight wounds, still in a five up save. Uh, does have a five up after save. Let's talk about the rules with this guy though that matter because this guy does a lot of stuff. So yeah. many rules. Mm -hmm. In addition. He subtracts two inches from the distance enemy models can pile in to a minimum of one while they're within three of this model. Uh, remember, he can pile in in any direction. Uh, so he can, like, charge in and then pull out to three inches and make it so, like, if he does it right, the guys on the edge can only pile an inch and he can kind of cause a traffic jam of people not being able to, like, pile around the people he's locking in effectively. Uh, like most of these guys, he does have a three-inch range. And uh, so he himself can still strike people if he's just towing the line at the edge of the three-inch line. Uh, so that's a that's cool. Uh, uh, by the way, we haven't. I don't know if we've officially announced it, but the pile-in wars have begun. Yeah. Uh, begun. The pile-in wars have. Yep. Uh, so, someone asked, um, "How does he move one to twenty-one? Just very quickly. There's all kinds of spells and other tricks that this army has just to like double move. All kinds of crap. Just." Yeah, Zero to go. it's being under the speed of Aish and then using the Helon command ability and being in the battalion is the short answer. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't feel anybody it, like it's true. Just, you'll have to trust me. The math is correct. Um, so uh, when he, in addition, uh, you roll a dice for each enemy unit that's within uh, three inches of this model when it makes a charge move on a three up, they take one mortal wound and get an egg one to hit. So that's cool. So he can, when he charges into people, he'll also give them Neg 1 to hit, further making sure that he can kind of stay alive if he ever does go into melee, which he doesn't necessarily have to, for reasons we'll talk about in a second. Uh, 
he can scour, so uh, at the start of the charge phase, you can pick a faction terrain piece and roll a die. On a two-up, you destroy it, but then he can't within charge. Within, like, one inch? Uh, yeah, has to be within an inch of him. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, it, like, sorry, OBR, your obelisks are just dead, because, like, I would absolutely destroy the OBR obelisk, because I could probably float him up to within an inch of that thing and still keep him really safe, because of the way they always put that thing right in the center of the board, right? So, like, that thing's dead. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, most terrain pieces are pretty bunkered in people's territory. Uh, and so it's not going to be super often used. And the fact is it doesn't, like, pick up the terrain piece. It just removes its special rules. So, like, who cares if they destroy your IDK boat? Like, all right, again, IDK boats are annoying because they're just a physical object in the way. Not because right. they sort of might do hit you for a mortal wound one sometime. Uh, after he makes a normal move, uh, including this, I love this. Okay. After this model makes a normal move, begin parins, including if it moves at the end of the shooting phase, close parins, which is not a normal move. <laughs> like what, how, when that's not, you can't include that normal moves is a defined thing in this game. It is. Okay. And then they just said, and also for no reason, also jack in this other weird movement he has. Like, Which is also an FAQ question. Yeah. Which, I mean, they're treating that other movement as normal move. Yeah. Which means they, they can't move within three inches of an enemy. It can't, like, it it, it, it adopts all the limitations sure. of normal moves. It yes. just didn't need to be there for this. But anyways, so he can float over people, pick an enemy unit. Uh, he rolls a die on a three up. They take D3 mortal wounds. So that's cool. Yep. Uh, Spear of the Wind, at the end of the shooting phase, this model can make a normal move of 12 inches, but it cannot run or retreat. Uh, in addition, this model can't... In addition, it says like 17 times on this scroll, uh, this model can retreat and still charge later in the same turn, so that's cool. Uh, which is actually really good, because if you did want to keep bouncing people, as they start trying... Like, you're holding them at an inch pile in, and they're getting stuck, so he can keep floating out and coming back in and hitting them and then sneaking out. So he can kind of be bouncing off of them like this, slowing down, holding, limiting their movement, things like that, right? Keeping other pieces safe. Like, he can kind of do that, and then you could have, like, some Wind Riders at three inches, and they can't really get to them, and the Wind Riders also have a three-inch reach, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of complicated stuff going on there. Again, this is what I'm talking about with skill floor. Because if you want to use that Huracan and stuff well, you have to, like, understand this, like, razor-sharp positioning, be using all these pieces exactly correctly, piling into the exact right place with the entire thing, then retreating out, then blah, 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 and so on and so forth. The Severith cannot use Helon. The regular uh, guy can use the Helon ability. That's who... That's why I said the normal fox can move 121 inches. Uh, so, uh, and then in your hero phase, this model is within 12 inches of a friendly wind mage. You can also heal it. So. Cool. Neat. Um, the, yeah, that's this guy's, the normal version of him, by the way, loses the destroy faction terrain and loses the, I do uh, D3 mortals on a three up when I move over people. He's also two fewer wounds, one less rend on the bow. Yes. He is only rend neg two and eight wounds instead of rend neg three and ten wounds. Oh, you so, know what, gentlemen? I, and this Severeth himself okay. is locked to Yometrica. There you go. Okay. Yes. Final mm -hmm. thing to say. This dude has a bucket load of rules. He is three hundred points. Uh, what's your take? Um, I do appreciate that it's a more, um, it's not a, like Avalonor and the normal spirit of the mountain. Yep. The spirit, the normal spirit of the mountain, I'd argue is one of, is the most overcosted war scroll in this faction. Like just the value that I think Avalonor brings to the table is light years beyond what the generic version can do. I agree. Um, I've that said, I think, I'm, I'm on record saying I think Avalonor, the named one, needs to go up 10 or 20 points, and the non-named one needs to come down 10 or 20 points. Okay, continue. He, no, it needs to come down, like, much more than that. But anyway, um, Severeth and the Wind Spirit, like, the value between them is much more nuanced, and you you gain, like, it's it's a much 
the tougher decision to make. And I appreciate that. I appreciate how they made the two scrolls relatively similar in power. There's real decisions to be made between these two units. And I like that. And in sure. fact, like Severeth, Severeth hasn't shown up in any of my lists, but the generic Fox has. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to address the elephant in the room with this guy. Tom's video froze, which is funny because he looks very contemplative now. We can still hear you fine, Tom. You just your video froze, which is funny. Uh, that's amazing. Um, my guess is your your laptop's about to die because you forgot to plug it in. No, I'm at 100%. Okay. Yo. That's where that usually happens. Anyways, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the off-turn 12-inch float that both he and his little non-named brother have, meaning that it becomes almost impossible to charge this guy in melee. Uh, we all hope together that they FAQ that, of course, because yes, yeah. this guy can float 12 inches in every shooting phase, not just yours. Uh... That should be FAQ to only be your shooting phase, of course. Uh, of course. But yeah. otherwise, yes, he becomes nearly impossible to charge. Because somebody moves up to within three inches, then you float back 12, you're out of charge range now. It's just that. That's the math, folks. I don't know uh, what else to tell no, you. you could just write it, may there only be charged by marauders. <laughs> no, because they see <laughs> you're still not within 12 to declare the charge. But you may be within 12 to declare the charge of another unit, and then you just no. roll the hard dice. To get a, fair point. a fair point. Prosecutors yeah. and I think the Charybdis or War Hydra. Yeah, can, the, the can few units that the War Stomper Mega Gargant that I always build has a 3d6 charge yeah. and can declare out to 18 inches. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, as it stands now, if they keep the you can float in every phase, if they keep that, like if that's FAQ, he's immune like, to melee. He's very, very uh, immune is strong, but it's not that wrong. <laughs> like it's close, right? Like you one have to trap him. Hopes, oh, yeah. yeah and you've got to start like trying to surround him, and and just like uh, which I love the idea of. Like I don't hate that idea. <laughs> sure. Uh, it, <laughs> that's a funny question, Stephen Powell. So per scale, how far is 121 inches, and how fast is that in real life? I wish we had that table. Oh my God, that would be so fantastic. If we had like, because you could do the D&D, &D, you know, sort of things. Everybody has fun doing that of like, how well, fast are you actually running? Well, six inches would be 30 feet equivalent, right? Like, if that's, that's what standard. we're saying, if that's, are we just using the D&D &D metric here? So six inches, no, five inches would be 30 Five feet. inches, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay. Because normal humans move five inches. So if yep. we're saying that's a 30 foot move, right? If we're just going to use the D&D &D right. metric, Right. Right. Okay. It would be 300 feet at 100 move. Uh, well, if it's 5-inch base, then basically times that by 5, right? Let's just, let's just keep it simple yeah, here. Sure. So sure. he moves 150 yep. feet. Or you take it up. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't no. matter. Yeah. It's 120 divided by 5. We haven't even gotten to the wind riders yet. Times 30. That's the math. Okay. So it'd be super fast. He runs real fast. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, you got to go on a little fox hunt and try to trap and surround him, and it's very hard. Uh, so the um, the answer is, we hope they change that. Competitively, I think this guy's interesting. I'm not sure. Like, assuming they fix the float twelve inches rule, okay. Assuming yeah. that is fixed, as it should be, right? Then a. Uh, That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, people, people are working out the math and shit. Yeah, exactly. Like, You've started something here. Okay. At any rate, uh, assuming they fix that, I honestly think this guy's probably fine. Like, it's weird for me to say that, but he has a lot of rules. Like, he has a ton of weird rules. But his damage is like, it's okay. It's not... It, you know, it's, it's fine. It's 250 to 300 points. Like, it, it's doing the appropriate scale damage. Right. Even shooting for what he is. Yeah. I mean, he's four attacks on twos and threes. His rend is fantastic, yes. Right? And he has, and he does D3 damage, which is very swingy, right? Uh, which, so it's, it's sort of unreliable damage. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure that 
you know, I, I think of this guy, surprisingly, somehow, I think this guy's probably okay. Like, I, I think he's good. He's real good. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I'm not sure he's, like, he's not over the top. or overpowered or over the top. No. I think that a lot of, like, I think it's easy to look at all these ridiculous rules he has, which he does have a lot. But I think that, like, if your army does have any kind of shooting, and again, if the 12 inches off turn gets fixed, it's not that hard to chase down this guy and kill him. Because, like, he's got to go somewhere. His bow is only an 18-inch range. Right? right? He does actually have to be pretty danger close to shoot at you. So if, like, he's trying yeah, I mean, to come no, in and... I mean, that's not true. Because he's going to shoot and move, so he's always going to move to 30 inches. Yeah, I understand that. Like, yeah. he can... It My my point is, the target he wants to shoot at, he might not be at 18 inches for. Right, but saying? he's going to move up 24, shoot 18, and then move back 12. I'm, I understand that. So he'll be that. 30 from My the point target. is, if he's trying... People, the way people would want to use him, four shots into a unit of 30 dudes, it's just yeah, not going to... It's not cutting the mustard. Who cares? No. no. Right? The way you want to use this guy is shooting heroes or something like that, yes. right? He's going to remove strategic pieces. So he's on threes and threes effectively in that case, right? Yep. Yep. And, you know, like, at that point, his damage is, again, it's good. It's not bad. It's good. Uh, certainly against a four-up save, he'll, he'll resolve a decent-ish amount of damage. But, like, then, so let's say he's got to come up to, like, 12 inches to get your hero because you, you bunkered him six inches behind the line. Right, and then he floats twenty four inches away. There's plenty of stuff in the game that will go catch that. Sure. Right. Yep. Yep. So, like, yes, he's tough to catch, um, and if you have shooting, if you yourself have shooting, this guy's in like, you know, he's Nothing. in danger, right? <laughs> Uh, like yep. OBR catapults are like destroy my my obelisk. We'll show you, foul villain. Like that five up save is gonna be a bad time for him when those five damage rocks start coming in, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that make the same attacks he does on on almost the same profile, only five damage and no rend, but the same twos and threes, four attacks or whatever. Uh, yeah, I, he's like despite how much this dude was hyped, and I think he is good. He's one guy, right? Yeah. He, he's one guy on a five up save with a five up after save. Like, yeah. I, I think he is annoying, right? He will frustrate people and some armies will be much more prone to being frustrated by him. So you're saying that he's, he's going to, okay. he's going to be a highly mobile ranged attacking piece that will frustrate the opponent. Yeah. So yeah. it sounds pretty like banging on all cylinders of him. Oh, and restricting pylons to one inch. Sure, if he wants to go get in melee, which again is a, it's he has well, some good control not, features. He may not. He may not have a choice. Like he may be. Sure. Like somebody may come at him. But all of that to say, that all sounds pretty MPE to me. He he very much could be very NPE. I think it will depend a lot on what your force happens to consist of. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I you know, he's I think he's probably pointed correct. He's gonna frust be frustrating, but I think it's actually the right number of points. No, I would agree with that. Yeah. It feels right like I haven't played with him, but it feels right just on on the read and knowing how he would play. Yes, and I agree. KO will like laugh at this guy because there's Yeah, be, like, KO, KO's like Oh, what do you got over there? Yeah, bring in the long guns. Let's get rid of this dude. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it should be noted that he is not a monster. No, he is not. Um, so they can get cover. Uh, and they can and they can stand on, and he can stand on the shrine. Sure. Because he is, he is a hero. Uh, he's not a wizard, though. No, he's, you've got to oh, be a wizard. Oh, you're right. Yes, you have to be a wizard oh, on the right. shrine. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. That's a good call. But he can yep. he can stand yep. on terrain, which is fine. He can, or he can garrison normal buildings. Uh, that is true. He could go. He could go hop in a building. Okay, let's keep moving. Huracan and yep. wind chargers. There uh, we go. 
All right, Battle Line and Helon. Incredible mobility. Moderate range damage, but very hard to control. Good damage if they go all in. I will point out that even outside of Helon, if you factor in the damage from their bow and then they charge and make their full attacks, they do more average damage against a 4-up save than a Keeper of Secrets. I see no issues there. That seems completely reasonable. <laughs> I, I, I'm i sorry I couldn't help myself with that one, but that math is uh, fun. Um, they Their bow in melee does not get the Helon bonus. I want to be super clear here, okay? Because, like, the it, it will get the missile weapon when they shoot, they will get it. But they do not get the plus one attack with their wind charger bow melee weapon profile because Helon's ability specifically says missile weapons. Missile weapons has a very discreet definition on this thing. It is this thing. That's why it's under this th this area called missile weapons. Okay. Oh, but now Siri wants to talk to me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's fun. Slightly higher damage than a, than a Keeper of Secrets for 130 points. Seems completely reasonable. Uh, and they do have ridiculous movement shenanigans when you put them in the battalion. We'll talk about the battalion in a moment. Uh, yeah, they're real we're, good. We're, we're not even three units yet. No, I know. We no. Got a lot. That's why we got to keep moving. These guys are good. Mm, yeah. Best new unit that was introduced. Super potent. Again, their damage, as though even though I said it is slightly better than a Keeper of Secrets, which is true... They their damage is still like okay. By the way, what that is is about seven point one five or something like that. All in, okay. So it's not incredible. Just to to lay that out, right? Their bow does have neg two rend in combat because again they turn their bow sideways. It's a kill shot. That's why it's neg rend two. It's a kill shot. Uh, and uh, yeah, they can uh they can move over terrain normally as they can fly, or they can also fly and become move sixteen if they start near uh wind mage and they can fly when they pile in they fly a lot is the point uh and um yeah and they ignore cover uh yeah the uh the story i tell here all the time is in magic there was a creature called a wind drake Okay, and a wind drake was a 2-2 flying creature for 3, which is very unimpressive in magic. And yet, he became known as the win drake. And lots of different versions of 2-2 flying blue creatures for 3 got printed, and they all collectively just got called wind drakes. Because oftentimes blue decks would win by simply controlling you and then pinging you for 2 with a wind drake every round and just slowly killing you Chinese drip torture style or whatever, right? Just get, dip, dip, two, 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 and you're dead. Uh, so sometimes even a humble 2-2 two -two flyer can get there. This guy, I, I love that in Magic they were called Wind Drakes, and it became Win Drake, hence Win Chargers. Uh, there's no D on this War Scroll. My, my War Scroll didn't come with a D. I don't know. They don't have the D because they gave it to you. So... Uh, that's where <laughs> this unit comes from. It's it after midnight. We can, we can say midnight. stuff like that now. Or <laughs> yeah. every week um, after midnight. Now, um, someone asked at the very beginning of the chat, like, I don't really have many thoughts on them. They they play in a way that um, I, I, like, I really was, like, more of the combined arms, the Venari stuff like that, um, that really hooked me. This This plays in a way... That just you you almost entirely play around your opponent, like the pilot the the pylon wars are currently like they are winning the pylon wars. Sure, they pile out. They 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 pile in whatever direction they want instead of piling in the normal way. Uh, but someone asked at the very beginning of the chat, like I want to say two or three hours ago, um, are these supposed to be like like Mongols? It's like no, these are our Illyrian Reavers. Yeah, sure. like yes. they've been they've been bit by bit kind of remaking some of the units from old high elves. These are your fast calf. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's Illyrian all. Illyrian Reavers will be my counts as. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> For this unit. Yes. Yep. Again, uh, one of the better units probably in the meta period right now. They have everything they need to win between their their hurricane ability and their speed. 
these are an incredibly, incredibly powerful unit. Like, yep, to control the battlefield with correct. their movement. Um, and because you know, so one of the uh, invinces like army how to you know lose friends or whatever. One of his one of the tactics that he proposed was moving up three of these units, for, like to to hold objectives or to screen or whatever. And like you'll get into one of them. But even if you charge to all three, as after that activation, the other two just leave because you you double activate the other two just leave combat. Yep, and they can do that all game. Right, like that's the key. You got to think about. It. Imagine I have three units of 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 wind chargers. Okay, I've got three units of wind chargers blocking your space to where you want to come forward to the objectives. You charge all three of them. Okay, well, it's your turn, so you get to activate first. Okay, I'll activate and I'll attack this one. Maybe you kill that unit of five dudes. Maybe you don't. Maybe I'm in Sayer and I double penny them. So now there are three of them saved. Okay? So you don't kill all of them. My turn. I activate the other two wind chargers. I pile away six inches. So even with your charge, you can't get back into combat against them. Right. You'd have to have a three-inch range weapon. Which most people don't have. Like, giants could still catch them. Or six-inch pylon. Enemy wardens or, or six-inch pylon, yes. Most units will just be like, oh, okay. And I just I walk away unscathed. And then you're like, okay, are you turn is your turn done? Awesome. Now I'm gonna, you know, move in such a way as to be a hindrance or not. Right. Now I just or... put him back and we do yeah. it again. Yeah. And we yeah. do it again. And you charge me and I just leave. Yeah, and I just leave. Yeah. I just spend the whole game going, nope, 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 and pulling him back. And I'm just I'm limiting you to basically going nowhere every round. Right. And so that one hero or that small unit on an objective, you just can't get there. Right. Because there's always this unit in the way that you're going to charge, and then it'll just pile back six inches and stay out of reach of you all game. Right. And heaven forbid Sephiroth or whoever is in there, who's nearby, who could reduce your pile into one inch. Yep. Because like, like I just really want to make sure we're driving this home. Like I could alpha bunker you in with these guys, sit three inches off your line, you charge me, like one, maybe one dies, maybe one doesn't. The other two just leave six, like leave six inches. Right, and then on my turn, I go back to three inches away. And wait. So you're locked in combat again, right? right. And so like, so, like, I've made your move speed of your army three inches. Right. Right, because you can go back in, lock them in combat, and then as soon as they would attack, you know, like, and then pile up, pile back out. It's just, yep. Hope you it's got a three-inch reach weapon. Right. That's gonna be really frustrating. Yes, like that. This is what I'm talking about. This is how you. This is this is like a key strat in my how to lose friends and alienate people army, right? Because meanwhile, <laughs> what I'm doing is holding all the points behind you, right, and just winning the game. Like I set up my lore seeker. He's holding a point. It's, he's fine. You know, like again, if you can shoot him down, great. You shoot him down. But for melee focused armies, like whatever. What happens if I get double? Then you just spent two turns killing five models. Right. Yes, exactly. Because the sec you get to pick one. Okay, you double me. I go back six inches, you're three away. You charge me again. Okay? Right. Activate one. You kill one of my maybe you kill one of my units, maybe you don't. You you get one unit activation. And when that one unit activation is done. I'm gonna take the other two out I of combat. Right. Right. You cannot kill more than one unit per your per combat phase. Period. Yeah. Unless you get into more than three units at a time. Right, more than three mm -hmm. units at a time. Which, by the way, I would make it so you're getting into three units at a time. And, like, ideally, you just take, like, five units of three or something. Like, or, sorry, you know what I'm saying? Five units of five. Five units of five. five. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, you just, let, and you just layer them so that, like, you can continue to stagger and delay and, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And as we said, their oh. bows get better range and better rend in combat because they turn them sideways. It's a kill shot. That's... It's written in the lore, I'm pretty sure. Page page uh, 742 page of the Lumineth Realm Lords book. The wind chargers turn their bows sideways for kill shots. Okay. In melee. Uh, Ballastees. Let's talk about the Ballastees. Uh, decent, but uh, reasonable ranged output. Probably compares poorly to Sentinels, but it's an easy throw-in unit at 100 points. Uh, they have two attack space. They go to three if they don't move, four in the battalion. I don't think you'll take the battalion very often for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the shooting's okay. You know, 30-inch range is good. Certainly, it's very great. 
Um, but, you know, threes and threes, neg two, D3 damage. Yeah. Yeah. They're fine. Right? I mean, <laughs> like, yep. They get a six up ward save. Okay. Yeah. Like, it's fine. They, they can once per battle make somebody neg one to hit, so it's more neg one to hit. Uh, coming out of these guys, uh, another opportunity at Neg one to hit, which is great. This is again going back to the skill four thing, right? Like being in Shining Company and knowing when you're going to get charged, and then making sure you know that unit's going to charge. You know, so you hit them with the Neg one to hit. So then when they come into your Shining Company, you're Neg two or Neg three because the other thing's going on because you've also got a big Stone Mountain guy hanging around and he's giving him a Neg one, and suddenly like now you're holding your point with a Neg three to be hit in that one turn that you really need to hold it for. And if you execute that at the right moment and have the units in the right position, then you just win out of hand. If you do it wrong, you lose, right? Like, that's... So, I think this will show up as a one -er in a lot of lists because it's neat to have a neg one to hit kind of on tap for when you want it, and it is the cheapest unit yep. in the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I just I, I only I only just now realized it's the cheapest unit in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I was like, wait a minute, he's right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, like in uh, building lists, I kept having a hundred points left or something round about that, and I was like, okay, well, the the scenario, list. like the one, like the one scribe, is hundred points. It's yeah, high. That's true. Yes. He yeah. is the other. T he is the other. What would you player. rather? What would you rather have? An auto uh, eclipse every other turn, or a or a crossbow that doesn't turn sideways in melee? I'm taking other things for my for my. Right. That, you'll find twenty more points and put in ten more bodies somewhere. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, yeah, but this is cool. I I think it's fine. It's, it's fine, Alyssa. It's fine. Yeah. And it it, it it does both throw things. It does both throw things. It's not like crazy it's not blowing up units it's damages again it's you know d3 so fine like okay doesn't doesn't break rules no it's this is just like yeah that's why it's so weird to talk about because it's just like oh, okay like a ballista sure it shoots like three times on threes and threes at neg two d3 damage so it's like fair so it's just like a it's like a ballista like a normal artillery piece that we would expect to see at an army yeah okay cool it's like all right Cool. Yeah, it's fine. Venari Blade Lords. All right. All right, here we go. Talk about them great swords. Uh, we talked about why their rules around their swords are stupid. I stand behind that. I don't care that they're actually probably not the best scroll, but that's fine. Uh, they, they have sun metal weapons, but they don't actually have sun metal weapons. I know on the scroll it says sun metal weapons. That's a lie. I really want to know the backstory to these. Like, was that pulled at the last moment yeah. because it was too powerful? I have to believe the answer is yes. In, like, late-stage playtesting, they were like, oh, whoa, whoa, it's way too powerful if these guys can swing in in chopper mode with, with sun metal weapons, so we got to pull that. Um, their main role is as the bodyguard for Scenari, which I think is actually really good because, as mentioned, they do bodyguard uh, Scenari models. On a two-up, they take their their wounds, which is really which is really strong, especially because you have Scenari like the lore seeker you want to keep alive. They're pretty average to low average on damage. Um, but you do get them as battle line, one unit of these as battle line for each Scenari hero. And they're 120 points for 10 wounds on a 4-up save uh, that has a 4-up shrug against spells and endless spells. Which is cool. Uh, I've already talked about their weapons and why their weapons are stupid. And I hate having, and I hate attacking with these things. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. Can I say my thing? Yeah, go, man. Yeah, because this has already been a long show, and I don't want to drag it down too much. But it was like this, 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 like, um, I was, I was hoping this was the opportunity for us to get a true hammer, like glass cannon unit. Sure. Like th this game already punishes elite infantry enough. Yeah. Like it's going to be five to ten bases in a unit. Like for their max fifteen, they're small bases. Um, they're technic, they're technically slow. I get that you can ramp that up, but like. I, um, I, w I would think the balancing factor is building so much around them to create the delivery system, like either between Teclas as the umbrella to protect them from damage and then buffing their speed 
would be the balancing factor of saying, let them doing ridiculous amounts of damage. But they are a blade of wounds for a wizard dressed up as samurai. They are, I was, I wanted this to actually be the killing power, like a killing unit in the army, and it's not. And I, I yeah, I wanted more. I, they are worth the points of uh, for the utility they provide as that bodyguard. Absolutely, like it is not. It is not quite a bad unit, um, but yeah, I did not get what I wanted out of this unit. Sure, Tom, you like these guys, right? I like the stock. Yeah, sure. Like, I just, I, I like them. I do, and like, I wish that I could, in good conscience, run more of them. Like the list that I that I, that I'm leaning towards only has ten, but I'd love to run thirty of them. I just I can't in good conscience like they don't do enough as Martin is kind of saying to actually have to to fill all of those other roles. Right. So, um, but I think ten are great, especially either as a bodyguard to the twins. Yep. Um, or as a bodyguard to a lore like a lore keeper. Gentlemen, um, I added a slide since I shared this with you earlier. Would you like to see a tragedy in two acts? Sure. <laughs> a, a story of tragedy in two acts, which I will call the pain of testing. On the top of this slide, which will come onto your screen in just a moment here, is the current profile of the Venari Blade Lords and the Slancor Fiend Bloods. I use both of these because they're both instructive. <laughs> on the bottom of these two scroll, on the, on the bottom here, I have the rules for the, that unit as it existed when we got a preview of it in Mayari's Purifiers and the Dread Pageant. And in both cases, I think both, this is the one place where Lumineth and Slanesh are completely combined. We stand together that it probably would have just been a better unit had it actually just been the thing that was there in the like, actual yeah. preview from the Underworlds Warband. Miari's yeah. Purifier is great sword. He's like the greatest great sword. Because he has, instead of dealing with this dumb perfect strike, flurry of blows, stupid nonsense, right? Okay. Yep. Instead two attacks, twos and twos. Two attacks, twos and twos, neg one, one damage, but he has sun metal. Right? So, doesn't have the rend two of the perfect strike or the auto hit. Doesn't have the big sweepy thing. But two attacks on twos and twos, neg one with sun metal. Meaning they can get super choppy and get pushed to like a five up, right? By somebody like the Lord Regent. Sure. Okay. Same thing, by the way, with the Fiend Bloods. If we, if we had just got like that profile of four attacks on fours, threes, neg two, two damage for this for the Fiend Bloods instead of the joke yep. of the scroll we got... Everybody would have been happy. This is what I call a tragedy in two acts, right? We all got excited by this little spoiling of information. It was like, oh, this is what we're going to get? These dudes are cool. Like, okay, that would be a I unit. love these guys. I am in. Like, that, Martin, that would have been your hammer unit you wanted. Yes, absolutely. And instead, we, like, got to the real scroll, and, and they lost their way, right? They were right. just like... No, let's give him this bodyguard rule, and we gotta have something to shrug and off the magic, spells and the magic of flag, yeah, the banners, and and we'll have them bodyguard people. And it's uh, well, no. I, uh, Doug, Doug could tell you that um, even even in Warhammer Fantasy, Swordmasters were always the secret police and guardians of the mage, so it makes sense that they have like a mage bodyguard rule. I just wish that wasn't the main attraction. Right. Yeah. Get rid of the spell thing. Like, I think the right answer for this unit is get rid of the spell thing, move the bodyguarding to a four up so it's not as reliable, right? Yep. yep. Uh, and then turn their, get rid of their dumb dual weapon profile and just give them standard sun metal greatswords and move their points up to like 140 or something like that. Done. Yeah. There you go. Now you've got a great, elite, fun uh, hammer swordmaster unit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's not what we got, but that's not what we got. Okay. Is it, is it the end of the I units, mean, I think? That is the end of the said, units. That yeah. said, I still like them. Like, 
Sure. I Oh, they're in my list. It's just yeah. Yeah, like um I think we're all just my... sad that they're not what we were hoping they were. Sure. Yeah. You know what my big like my my two stage tragedy was? I really want to talk was, about battalions, but sure, go ahead. That's fine. Was knowing was like realizing <laughs> what their role was in the bat on the battlefield. Yep. And then discovering that Teclas didn't have the scenario keyword. Sure, sure. All right. Uh battalions. So new battalions. We can wrap these through these pretty quickly. We're we're almost through this, folks. Appreciate everybody yeah. hanging in there. Hey. Thank you all for hanging in there. You know what I like? All of you. You know what you could like? This show. Just hit the button. Okay, so at any rate, uh, New Battalions. The, right there you go. Good man. The Huracan and Temple, uh, which consists of Severeth, uh, or the regular dude, uh, the Wind Mage, and one to three Wind Chargers. Units in that move six inches in every combat phase, regardless of enemies. That's not what it says. It says they count as charging every round, as long as they're near a hero. Right. What it means is that in every combat phase, yours and the enemies, every combat phase, regardless of whether there's enemies near, I could have some wind chargers just standing over here all by their lonesome, nowhere near an enemy in the enemy turn. They just move six inches. Because when you charge, you always are able to pile in. And when they pile in, they can always move six inches and they can pile in in any direction. So every combat phase, every unit of wind chargers and the wind mage, assuming they're near a hero. And then the, all the wind mages and Severeth and the fox, if he's near a hero, just get to go six inches. Well, thank you, John. In, in, I in any that. direction. Yes, yeah. in any direction. This is the best battalion in the book. It is the best battalion in the book. It's 180 points. Worth it every time. This is like the core of every list I've built out with this army when I was just playing with armies. I'm not going to play this army, but like if I was, boy, oh boy, would this be my foundation every time. Uh, ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. Uh, I am officially trying to get rid of a, a Boggart because this is ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. Uh, your next one is the Star Shard Battery, which is the Caligrave, Mr. Pen, Pointy Shoes, uh, and 3 to 5 Ballasty, uh, and they get plus 1 attack, as long as they're kind of near each other is what has to happen, and they get plus 1 attack, and their Warding Lantern becomes a 5 up. Okay. Yeah. Neat. If you're, if you're heavy in on Ballista, it could be a cool strat. I mean, it's very fragile. That's the problem with, with Ballista, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. it's five wounds on a low save with a six up feel no pain or a five up feel no pain. Yeah, it's tough. Do we, yeah, and Blade Lord host Ipsum Lorem. Blade Lord host Ipsum Lorem. Hey, text. hey, Correct. I like it. Sure. Like, I started here. It's funny. I started with a Blade Lord host uh, because I love having. Uh, you know, like I can slap a hero in there, and there's a lot of scenario or Venari heroes that I'd want to take. Well, I, I, uh, since, uh, I just want to ask something, and this I think this is where the, the hidden value of Blade Lords comes in. Um, because of the the introduction of the Lord Regent, we have that fast that fast cavalry hero, which can tank a little bit. Um, and another thing, like we no longer need to lower our drops as much as possible right. unless we're like kind of taking techless. So the question then becomes, it's like you, you, you have to have a higher level of scrutiny on the battalions in general before you want to take them. They could just be more bodies. Now the question, um, the main penalty is that you don't, you don't obviously you don't have the, cho the choice of who, who takes top of one, but that, that leaves you vulnerable to your heroes getting shot. And you no longer have to worry about that as much because most of your heroes will be guarded by a unit of Blade Lords, which is not only bodies, even if it's only five bodies, but it's also cheaper than every battalion in the book. Sure. Right. It's a very cheap battalion. Yeah, and it should yeah. say that like if you're taking a couple uh, of those heroes, like they are making the Blade Lords battle line, so you are filling out both like probably critical yeah. heroes you were already going to take and battle line with the Blade Lord host. Um, thank you very much to John and Isaac. You were correct. I that is something I misread and put in my notes, uh, which is they don't. It doesn't cause an extra plus one attack. It's a replacement text. 
So it just replaces the other text on the thing that gives them plus one attack. So they're still at three. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I apologize for the confusion. Uh, and as well, I don't think it's a bad deal. Like, honestly, if you look at the numbers, most of the time I wouldn't do the precise strike. Most of the time I would do the AOE Yeah, you're attack. doing sweeping blows, so suddenly you're on threes re-rolling ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, you know, if 50 attacks off of five or ten model, or, you know, so many, whatever many models, re-roll ones, I mean, that'll begin to do some work. Like, sure. that's not a bad bonus to have. Yeah. Because, like, especially if I'm getting a lot of attacks, it would not be unreasonable to spend a command point and get re-roll ones. Sure. And so that means that every time those units are fighting, you don't, you can save those command points for something else. I, I don't disagree. Um, no, it's 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 fine. If you're going in on like if you're gonna have Venari scenario heroes, which by the way you are, <laughs> right? Like yeah, just right. say that. So like right. one of them can go in here, right? And you and if you were gonna have like if you if you like the idea of blade lords and are willing to have two units of them, and you're gonna have another Venari or scenario hero in your list, right? Then. Yeah. Like, obviously not in this battalion, but that means that both of those Blade Lord units you take are battle line? Yep. Right? I mean, yeah. there you go. Like, you've taken not the bad. two heroes you probably were going to take, like a Lore Seeker and somebody. Maybe the twins or something, right? Yep. And then you've gotten, you filled out two or three battle line right there. It's not bad. Yep. With a cheap battalion. It is a cheap battalion, which is nice. That is, like, we cannot underestimate the value of a 100-point battalion. Like, that is cheap, yo, by by the standards of, like, most of these battalions. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so they're fine. I think a lot of the old battalions will still be used as well, and, will like, the the traditional battalion will still be used as well. You could get out a lot of armies. You could get out of like this battalion with under 500 points uh yeah that is true yes that is true i mean that's that ain't bad no the min cost for this is 440 points right yeah like there's not a lot of battalions in the game that you can get out that cheap sure yeah that's fair yeah it is a very good point tom it is a very good point uh, and that could be 440 points, again, that's filling out, like, some actually valuable stuff. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Oh, geez. Summary. Finally, gentlemen, we come to it, the end of the show, the summary of, uh, and the closing on the, the Lumineth 2021. Uh, here's my summary, but I, I want, I'll go first, and then I want you guys to wrap us up, and then we'll call it a night. The new units, spells, and options make this a full army with multiple viable lists. The new spell lore is has some nice options, including a teleport, which is great, because now with a teleport, one of the things we didn't mention before, but it's relevant that you can return units to Shining Company. Right? If they yeah. break out, you can teleport them and reset them up in Shining Company. Still not sure it's something I'm going to super do, but it's, a, it's an option, which is good. Uh, armies can now be built with extremely high mobility, effectively the highest mobility in the game. The army does lack some hammers, but it can do damage. But it does have to rely on synergy and or multiple combined attacks. The new terrain piece could be very impactful between the command points and the ability to control board space. And there are a lot of potential FAQs we are waiting for answers on. It is a powerful army, probably in the top six of the game. It will have a lot of NPE baked into it. It is an overcooked book. It has too many rules that should have been cut out. Uh, it is certainly not unbeatable, but I think it will be powerful. Uh, that's yeah. my summary. Martin, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah so I just have a, a quite, um for anyone who's going to get this far, I still don't understand the, the bin versus sin argument because that tells me you have either two options, a trash bin or two sin and I don't understand how one is better than the other. Rob uh, found a rhyming scheme he liked, and I, I didn't yeah. discuss it at all. I completely disagree with Rob's entire framing device. He was okay. talking about some good ideas, but he used a terrible framing device for it because it came up in one of his shows, and he really liked the rhyme of it. It's a yeah. bad framing device, Rob. And if you want it, yeah. I'll come on the show, and I'll give you And like it just should be talked about differently. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, I... I um, I said this online earlier this morning, um, how it's like, we, we, 
the play style did not change. It is still relatively defensive, reactive. You have ways to change that a little bit, but it's mostly going to be playing around your opponent, not really um, taking proactive action like aggressively with units that do lots of damage up front. Um, and in some ways, I appreciate that. Um, there, there's just so many options, not only with how to build your army now, but with how to play every turn out. All these different levers you can pull, all these knobs you can turn. Um, some of that is good, some of it is way too much. Yes, it is It is gloriously burnt. Uh, if that could, if, if, that, that's what I just said, Lumineth, gloriously burnt. I'll put that on a t-shirt uh, to replace my mountain stand shirt. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's. Uh, I, I look forward to a time in the relatively near future when there are events again um, on in mass, so we can really t see how long people stick with the army, uh, continue to either like see, maybe do well or not do well. I'm look. I'm looking forward to to that. Yep. Yeah. Tom. Yeah, I'm gonna reiterate what everyone else has said here um the only other things that i would add is that i think that this is going to be a notoriously difficult army to balance moving forward sure um because it is going to like it is a low body army high like technical side mm -hmm. where a lot of things are resting on the abilities themselves of the book and of the war scrolls not on points and so what's going to happen is is you're going to get into a situation where all the mpe that this army generates can't be adjusted for by points right um and instead what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of like people are going to want to adjust it with points and if you do that it'll become unplayable and so just because like it can't like there's some things that you just can't adjust for and you're just you'll get to a, a tipping point of having not enough bodies to even be able to play the game and so i uh i am concerned about the long-term health of this army either as a meta crushing monstrosity if if the points shift positively in its direction or an unplayable mess if it shifts the other way and so in true blue fashion it's really hard to balance yeah and it's control really has always been the hardest thing for magic to work out right right because spell at two is way too good it's the best spell in the entire game counter spell at four is trash that nobody uses in a deck <laughs> right like right. yeah right and so where is that middle ground and three isn't actually the right answer it's like 2.5 well we can't get to 2.5 so then what do we have to do in order to make it like too good not not too good but good enough um and so i i think that in the long run i have serious concerns about just the literally the army of abilities that are sitting in the war in the battle tome and on the war scrolls and i just don't know that there's an easy fix there um I, i'll say this i love the army um, I love the way that it plays. Um, I love all the tools that it brings. Like I said, I can file off numbers and do head swaps and stuff like that. That's fine. Um, it actually now ha it now feels like a whole army. If you go and watch our other review, one of my critiques and the reason why I didn't take the army was because I said it didn't feel done. It felt incomplete. Um, and this is why. It's because it was. And now we have the whole book. Um, at least this version of the whole book and i'm uh i'm overwhelmed by the options sure yeah i look forward to you getting your thousand points ready so we can take it to to holy havoc at the end of the year uh it's going to be a great tournament and make everyone just hate us is no, that what be, you well last time i had slanesh so everybody hated me while you were playing fun night hunt this time i'll be playing a fun army so there we go that's true all right well Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. This was a long one. I hope this was helpful. I hope we got into it. I hope we gave some insights and more than just, you know, reading the scrolls off the page or something. We, we try to really make sure we're breaking things down and giving you insights. We are going to have to see what happens, how the FAQs come out. Lots to uncover there. Martin, 
thank you, sir, so much for being here. You're sticking welcome. with us so late on a weeknight. All of you out there for sticking with us. You're all the champions, the true heroes. Don't forget to hit that like button on your way out. It does make it uh, easier for other people to find the channel, the show. If you haven't subscribed already, hey, please do. Uh, we'd love to see you back next week. We'll be back uh, covering the rest of the stuff in Broken Realms that isn't Lumineth, uh, as well as some of the narrative. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Don't worry, we will make the narrative part a its own little spoilery part, uh, but it's going to be fun to discuss. Uh, so we hope to see you then. But as always, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>